Someone met my wife, Jane, through a mutual friend. He and Jane got along well and began to spend time together on a regular basis. One never threatened me. He was consistently kind and pleasant. However, when you are connected with someone else's spouse, you are more cautious. They enjoyed sneaking around while I was at work, but something was lacking. They later informed me that it was a December night that they resolved to finish the missing piece of their puzzle. Jane invited someone to play cards with us after supper. He arrived at 8 p.m., and Jane greeted him cordially, hugging him, which, in my perspective, was not unusual. After all, they were buddies, initially. We sat on the couch, and I brought one of the beers from the fridge when I returned. One and Jane sat together, holding hands and resting them on his thighs. "'What's going on, guys?' I inquired, since their facial expressions resembled those of someone about to deliver bad news. "'Well, sweetheart,' she continued, "'we need to tell you something, but we'd rather you sit down.' I did responsibly and sat down while she continued to explain. "'One with whom I have had a close friendship for the last two months. "'You see, our chemistry is stronger than both of us. "'One thing led to another. "'We care for one another. "'I care about you, too. "'And I did not want to fool you. "'So we would like to make a proposition. "'One picked up where Jane had left off. "'We can't stop seeing each other. "'There is too much to ignore. "'But we wanted to make sure you were a part of our little plan.' We will continue to make love on a regular basis, but you will be there to watch. Perhaps you might provide a help now and then. He replied, smiling. Jane continued. Actually, you'll have a lot of fun. I investigated your search history and discovered you enjoy cuckold teaching videos. I rolled my eyes when she realized how humiliated I was. I saw the history on your browser, so I know it's exactly what you desire. To be honest, this will benefit a marriage. One started again so all we need from you is a signed paper stating that all parties to the contract accept the terms. I looked over the papers Jane took out of her suitcase. Some terms said that she and one would be exempt from any legal ramifications if the deal did not work out. Therefore, I decided to start divorce proceedings. Some points permitted various types of physical contact, such as kissing, embracing, and even taking a shower in bed. I stood there with a dry mouth, unsure what to say. Jane insisted, Look, I love you, but I also love one, and what you can do for me. It's nothing personal, but the way it makes me feel is something I can't give up. I know he feels the same way about me. Someone nodded in accord. Please sign the contract, sweetheart. From now on, everything will be like this. What shall I do? I didn't want a divorce, but I wasn't sure how I'd react to seeing another man in bed with Jane. I looked at them again, and her hands were still linked, but this time on her thigh. Jane looked at me seriously and said, Perhaps this will persuade you to sign. I watched as she drew one of his faces closer to her own and began kissing him. He responded by laying his hand on her cheek. A part of me could not believe what I was seeing. My wife was kissing another man. See you like this, he cried. That was when Jane approached me. I sighed as I looked at the contract, pen in hand. I couldn't hide this from them, and I wasn't sure whether it was the appropriate thing to do. I had researched cuckold teaching stories extensively for a case I was working on. You see, I'm a private detective who handles a lot of divorce cases in addition to running my own security company. I obviously hadn't done enough research, so I went into investigator mode, which I'm sure they didn't anticipate. I took out my small recorder and pushed the record button. To clarify, I'd like to record our chat to avoid future disagreements, simply for my own peace of mind. Do you understand? There's a lot of legal language here. I observed that you've both already logged in. Your signatures are notarized. Yes. John explained that we simply wanted to save time. We knew you would agree on this. Geraldine, our notary, will be here soon to notarize your consent so we can begin enjoying it. He smiled like a child at Christmas. To clarify, how long have I been in the dark about this? I can't believe I hadn't noticed. Jane laughed. We've been married for four and a half years and have been together for two and a half of them. John and I had a romance. Please do not mention it in those terms. He is my soulmate, and all along, we've been making true love. Perhaps I got carried away. Oh, Richard, don't be so self-centered. She is loving enough for both of us. He commented, and I glanced at them and understood my marriage was over. I took the pen, made my mark, and then stood up. I hope this has satisfied you. I showed them the scribbled document with the signature line. 
Jane looked at the contract. Son of a sorry. I'm not great at sharing. Now, look here. I shook the beer bottle in my fingers, pressing my thumb against its mouth. I grabbed the document, folded it, and slipped it towards her face. I turned around, collected my briefcase, laptop, and jacket, and, despite their requests to return inside, asked where I was going. I opened the front door. I ran into Geraldine, the notary. You must be Richard. Oh, my God. I got into my truck, backed up to the start of the driveway, engaged gear, and turned the steering wheel to the left. As I drove over the front lawn and through the rose bushes, it appeared on the Lexus's left rear panel. I realized I was acting like a teenager. Sue me. At least he is still alive. I went to her parents' place. I resolved to be proactive. And while I adore my in-laws, I wasn't going to be the villain. My phone rung with messages and texts. The mailbox eventually became filled and the calls and texts stopped. I parked in front of her parents' home and got out. I rang the doorbell and I heard something. Okay, okay, I'll come. The porch light turned on and I found myself face to face with her father, Judge Thomas Smith. He did not appear to be in a good mood. Richard, what exactly are you doing here at this hour? And where is Jane? I'm not sure where she is currently. Not on our world. I stated that despite having a son, my father-in-law and mother-in-law have always treated me with love and respect. In addition to my soon-to-be ex-wife, I gave the judge the contract and set my little recorder on the kitchen table. What is this? He inquired, began reading, and his eyes widened. Is that true? He asked. I put on the recorder and it all began when I requested if I may record the conversation to prevent misunderstandings, and she played it back. Her husband listened in. Suddenly, the robe she was holding opened, and her hand grabbed for her lips, covering it. She gasped, and the robe parted, displaying her black nightgown. So, I thought, her night was ruined. She finished reading and looked at me. I don't believe there's any way to avoid this, is there? How would you handle my situation? He looked down inside. I understand, son. Just then, the antique phone in their home rang. His wife responded. Hello, Mom. Is Richard there? I need to speak to him right now. Her father answered the phone. What is this? You two are having troubles with a scream and astonishment on the other end. Dad, what are you talking about? It is none of your concern. Not yours or Mom's. It's only about me and my hubby. You will be given a contract that outlines it. Otherwise, you've made this a family matter. Oh, no, cries. Oh, no. They know her father said goodbye to Jane and hung up. Dad, he turned to me and said, go get some rest tonight and do what you need to do. Just don't do something silly. Understood? Yes, sir. I'm really sorry for anything. This is not your fault, son. Sometimes the snake simply creeps inside the garden. I left. I got in my pickup, drove the handyman, and checked in for a week. I began reading the minibar, then fainted and vomited all over the floor. Fully dressed, I crawled into the shower, rinsed off, and collapsed on the bed. I fall into a realm of dreams. When I woke up the next morning and discovered I didn't have any clean clothes, I recomposed myself. I called another close buddy, Gerald, who was not sleeping with my wife, and asked him to get something fresh and bring it to the hotel room. 819. I was apprehensive about what was going on, so I assured him I'd explain everything when he arrived. Oh, and bring some muffins and plenty of coffee. Hurry up, buddy. I then contacted my office and directed my two best men to begin watching them. I called the bank and froze all of my accounts, both personal and commercial. We canceled all of our shared credit cards after paying off the outstanding balances. Next, I called to deactivate her mobile phone as part of my business plan with the company, and then to disconnect all of our home's public services. I called a legal buddy and she recommended a divorce attorney. My brother is exceptional. If you wish to inflict maximum damage, tell him I sent you. It's a fail-safe method that could lead to a bad conclusion. I contacted her brother and Gerald arrived just then. I got ready and went grocery shopping with him for breakfast. I told him about what had transpired the day before, as well as what I desired from my future lawyer. He told me to come to his office with everything I required. Around 3 p.m., we would talk about the strategy. Gerald didn't believe what he was hearing. I can't believe she could accomplish this, not for deception, but for offering a signed and notarized agreement. By the way, please let me know if you need anything else. I will contact you later and keep you updated. No problem, buddy, 
I never trusted why, and now I understand why, if you need anything at all. Astrid and I are always here. Astrid had been his wife for ten years, and she always treated me like a younger brother. He left, and I glanced at myself in the mirror. I looked horrible. Definitely an improvement from yesterday. Nonetheless, I left and went to the bank. I was immediately sent to the office of the senior vice president. I'm not a millionaire, but there was a large amount of money in both my personal and corporate accounts. He lunged at me. I do not understand your conduct. Of course, this is your money, and you can do whatever you want. Is there anything we can do to change your mind? Yes, sir. John worked. He was a senior financial consultant for the bank, so I placed the contract on the vice president's desk and started the recorder. His eyes glazed as he read the contract, but once he realized what he was reading and hearing, the color faded from his inflamed cheeks. This must be some sort of joke. If it is, I am not laughing. I can't keep doing business with an institution where the man who is sleeping with my wife works behind my back. My voice increased to a deep growl, which I'm sure the surrounding personnel noticed. Every syllable. I removed the contract from his shaky hands and grabbed the recorder. Inform John Samuels that legal paperwork will be served to him shortly. Have a nice day, sir. I turned around and walked away as I passed his office. I overheard him shouting, Get Samuels in here now! I laughed. I went to the supply station and printed three copies of the contract. I decided not to show anyone the original until it was in my lawyer's hands. Then I visited my insurance agent. You may guess who worked there, the future ex-wife. I was led into the owner's office, Miss Daphne Loria. I thought I heard Richard's voice muffled as I walked through her office. This is going well, I smiled. Miss Gloria rose up as I entered and shook my hand. Richard, nice to see you. How may we assist you? She appeared nervous and out of her element. I think you understand why I'm here. Daphne, I am canceling all of my insurance with your firm with immediate effect, and I would appreciate a refund check immediately away. I cannot do business with anyone who hires a deceitful and dishonest wife. Hold on a moment, Richard. Your personal feelings can impact how my firm does business. I picked up a copy of the contract from her desk and gazed at it. You should listen to the audio recording. She perused the three pages and briefly looked at the notary seal and signature. A tremor shook her upper body. Just a moment, please. She pressed the intercom button. Jane, you can come to my office right now. A few seconds later, my future ex-wife, evidently distressed, entered the office. Yes, Miss Gloria Jane, you're fired. Clean your desk and leave immediately. Jane hesitated, then fainted. Several people rushed to her side and helped her. Miss Gloria stood up and asked if my decision was still valid. I stood up to shake her hand. It's refreshing to work with someone with high integrity and professionalism. I believe I can leave my business where it is. I turned left, stepping over my ex-wife who was lying on the floor, and went to the lawyer's office. Nathaniel Thin, my lawyer, was slightly older than me but appeared to be younger. He was shrewd. He invited me to his office. He asked if I wanted anything to drink and then had his secretary bring us water. Now, Richard, I've spoken with my sister, and she seemed to believe I'll appreciate this. So, what have you got? I produced the original contract and then switched on my recorder. The tape ended and he listened to it. But the contract seemed to pique his interest more. When it was all over. He pressed the intercom button and his legal assistant entered. Come take this tape and make two copies. Then put the original in the safe. Purchase Mr. Daniels a new tape and return the recorder. He read again and occasionally glanced at me. Finally, he set aside the contract and looked at me. This is real, isn't it? No one could make something like this up. He pondered for a moment and then looked at me. Well, what do you want to do? I want to crucify them. I want to bring them so much misery that they can't find employment or have a public existence together. I want them to pay large. He grinned slightly and looked at me. I've never seen anything like it in my life. I won't miss the opportunity to be part of this for all the money in the world. The first thing we're going to do is bring the notary here and interrogate her. I've worked with her before, and I feel she'll cooperate. We'll have our own notary, and we'll do everything legally. Then we'll verify the tape's authenticity and use it to our advantage. We'll insist on a jury trial and defeat them. Oh, I said, I believe they have both lost their jobs. I caused a bit of a scene at the bank in her workplace. Better yet, if we just increase the pressure, if we get a jury trial, 
I'll take this case pro bono. I'm starting to enjoy this. That's the point. They have made no charges of defamation or slander. We have evidence that everything they said is true. As long as we stick to the facts, they can't do or say anything. The light slowly illuminated in my consciousness. They had exposed themselves. We invited the notary, and when everything was presented to her, she turned against them. Nathaniel set up a meeting with the judge and presented her case. He shook his head and glanced at me. I sympathize with you, Mr. Daniels, if I can. I'll do all in my power to remedy this. But are you sure you want the jury to hear this? My lawyer intervened. My client, Your Honor, wants the most agony and suffering for the woman who is still technically his wife, as well as the man with whom she has been associated. He wants his marriage annulled, and he wants her to leave with nothing. Absolutely nothing. Very good. Counselor, prepare it and see whether the other parties agree. We notified the other two and instructed them to sign the forms or contact a lawyer. They cried. They were nearly impoverished since their public services had been restored, and they were unemployed. However, she declined to sign, and he hoped for big compensation. Finally, they recruited an amateur to represent them. They didn't discuss the contract or the recording with their lawyer. We set a meeting in my lawyer's office to clarify everything. My lawyer checked the recording for synchronicity and sound validity. We were ready. They arrived at 11 a.m., accompanied by her father. I was shocked and slightly concerned. I should not have been. Jane approached me as if eager to hug. I resisted her attempts to mock my former pal. She began by claiming that it was all a great misunderstanding and that I had unleashed hell on them. Both lost their jobs. We were nearly broke and had no prospects for the future. I wrote a release of claims and sent it to the house, but without payment. They were sinking quickly. They attempted to sell the home, but luck was not on their favor. She wanted me back in her life, in her bed, and, more crucially, in her money account. My lawyer answered one inquiry with another. Do you still see Mr. Samuels? Her lawyer argued that it was irrelevant to the conversation. They're simply pals with these words. My lawyer took the contract from a stack of paperwork and placed it in front of the man. Let's try it again, he said, glancing at Jane as her lawyer read the document. Do you still see Mr. Samuels? She paled and nearly fainted. I'm not sure I want to answer that. It is too personal. Very nicely, Miss Farrell. You'll be able to answer that under oath in court. I became immensely satisfied as I watched their lives disintegrate. Her lawyer had finished reading the document and looked like he was going to faint. They never mentioned it before, he exclaimed. He turned to my attorney. All of this is rumor. They have no credible evidence. That's when my lawyer produced an affidavit from their notary, Miss Geraldine Schultz. He presented it to the lawyer, along with my signed and notarized affidavit describing what was said and required. Then he pulled out the tape recording. This is admissible in court because your clients were aware of what was happening and willingly accepted it. He said, my guy pressed play and their entire world fell apart. Her lawyer appeared horrified. That's when her father, the judge, spoke up and settled everything. He pounded the table with his palm while staring at her lawyer. Enough, Jane. Mr. Samuels, you are fired. Jane signed the documents, so clear your brain. Samuels, I need you gone by tomorrow night. Keep in mind that you are mentioned as a co-defendant in the divorce case. You'd better get legal help before Richard decides against you and Jane. I recognize that you will not gain anything from this. I feel going to trial will make things worse. My mother and I am disgusted by your behavior. Your brother refuses to bring his wife and children to our home while you are there. So you should start looking for another place to stay. You selected him over your marriage, so maybe your relationship will work out. I heard him murmur that beneath his breath. I hope it doesn't come out that Jane's parents were paying for her legal representation, so she signed everything when Samuel stood up and raced out of the room, disappearing from the face of the earth. I have nothing to do with it. Three months later, I was the only one sleeping on my bed, and I was a lonely man. Well, that happened last night. The Jones sisters promised to cheer me up tonight and tomorrow. Life is good. Story 2. I, 31, recently divorced my ex-wife, 28, due to her lies and infidelity. My wife and I initially met at a shopping center. I went to the mall to acquire some products because I only shop twice a month. As I was about to leave the shopping that day, my wife approached me and asked if I could look at her car. 
which had refused to start while she was checking it. I understood her difficulty was minimal and helped her solve it. I had no intention of making friends with her at first because all I wanted to do was help her and leave, but I ended up helping her fix her car. We had a terrific talk and ended up sharing contact information. We did not see each other again until a week later. I had completely forgotten about her, and if she hadn't phoned me back, things between us wouldn't have gotten so serious. Long story short, my wife and I began going out on her free days, and as we got to know each other more, love blossomed. We dated for a year before marrying, and my wife and I are now settled. According to my wife, she told me about her former relationship while I told her about mine. Her wealthy ex-boyfriend mistreated and physically abused her. They dated for four years, but when it came to taking care of her and giving her money and gifts, he was rather liberal. According to what I understood, my wife stated she had to leave her abusive ex-boyfriend because she was weary of being cheated on and abused. I understood her because I had a friend who was also in an abusive relationship, and I witnessed how hurt she was all the time. I even promised my wife that her marriage would be her safe haven and that I would never raise my hands against her no matter how angry I was, and I intended it. I had never beaten a woman before and had no intention of starting with her, as my wife had been living with me since the fifth month of our relationship, except for the fact that we wore our wedding bands and decorated our home with pictures for the first few months of our marriage, nothing changed. Everything ran very smoothly. My wife showered me with affection and made me feel like the only man in the world, since the house I resided in was given to me by my deceased father. We didn't have to pay rent. We simply had to pay for power bills, groceries, and gasoline. Honestly, I was the one who handled the bills. I made enough money to support both of us and I felt safe doing so. I never asked her about her pay or how she spent her money. I believed it was my obligation to take care of her bills as she was already accustomed to that lifestyle. We were still living in harmony after a year, with the exception of a couple of concerns with my employment that began in the tenth month of our marriage. Something happened to the organization where I worked and I was not paid for a full month. Not getting paid had a significant impact on my home life since I was unable to do the things I used to do. When we realized at work that we wouldn't be paid for that month, I wasn't concerned because I trusted my wife to handle the finances at home until everything returned to normal. What? I was completely mistaken that day. I got home and told my wife I hadn't been paid, thinking she'd calm me down and take charge for a bit, but she shocked me. She began to be overly emotional and then let it go. She inquired what we were going to do and I told her to take care of the house until everything returned to normal. Guess what, guys? My wife stated that she would only accept to help around the house. If I agreed to pay interest on the entire amount she would spend, when she stated this, I assumed she was joking, but she wasn't. She meant every word she spoke. Her attitude surprised me, given everything I had done for her from the moment we started dating until her marriage. To be honest, I wouldn't have believed it if someone had told me she would say something like that. Finally, I agreed to her terms, and she calculated every penny she would spend and gave me her interest rate. If paying interest and returning her money wasn't enough. That same week, my wife's attitude toward me shifted completely. I previously experienced problems with my employment. She used to be clinging and profess love to me all the time, but when she started paying the expenses at home, things changed. She no longer permitted me to touch her and she went from being a talkative person to being really frigid. I saw all of the changes and approached her about them. She said that it was her new mood, and that if I had any issues with it, I should deal with them. Respect had vanished from the way she spoke to me. Everything happened so quickly in the blink of an eye. I had no idea who my wife was anymore. To make matters worse, the company I worked for had to lay off some employees, and I had to leave after receiving my salary. When this happened, I didn't inform my wife because she made living at home intolerable. I informed my friends about it and happily, one of them contacted someone who had recently built a fine restaurant and I got a job there. I worked as a waiter at this posh restaurant for over two months and didn't inform my wife. The money was low in comparison to my prior salary, but it was better than doing nothing and getting abused by the woman who used to call me the air she breathed. What about the bills at home? After two months of her adding her exorbitant interest rate to the money she spent, I had to stop her, and we began splitting 50 fiftieths. Despite splitting the bills, our marriage did not return to normal. 
but I wasn't upset because my primary goal was to keep searching for jobs until I found something better than working at the restaurant. I feel my wife's respect would return once I regained my previous financial level. One day I was at the restaurant trying to sort through the orders of new customers when I noticed my wife strolling in. When I saw her, my heart skipped because I assumed she had learned that I worked there. To my amazement, she walked to a table where a man was already waiting for her, and they kissed. My heart broke instantaneously, and when I realized it was her ex-boyfriend, she told me she had stopped communicating with him. I almost peed in my trousers. One of my co-workers who had been there before me noticed the astonishment on my face and asked if everything was okay. It took me a few seconds to answer, but once I did, I informed him about my wife and her ex-boyfriend. He was similarly astonished and perplexed, but he understood more when I told him my wife was unaware I was working there. I and the co-worker that spoke with me were close, so we planned a strategy for me. After we had agreed on the idea, he proceeded to take their orders. The plan was for you to take their order, and then when their food was ready, I would go serve them while he recorded everything from behind. I carried out the plan we had made. I delivered the food to my wife and her ex-boyfriend without breaking stride. When she spotted me, her face paled and she vomited out the red wine she was drinking, surprised. I ended up leaving the food in front of her and her ex-boyfriend, and while I took my time, she practically froze and couldn't speak. Later that day, she did not return home. I knew she would not. So I eagerly packed her belongings and placed them outside. The next morning, she came to beg, saying her customary cheetah's line, Baby, I could explain. It's not as you think. This was the longest sentence she had said to me in days, and if I hadn't seen her, she would most likely have continued to cheat on me. I felt generous with my comments, so I urged her to go back to her wealthy ex-boyfriend and enjoy their poisonous relationship. She did not say anything after that. She just packed her belongings and departed. I seriously doubt her tears were genuine. We divorced weeks later, and everything between us ceased. Fortunately, months after working at the restaurant, I received a fantastic position with a lucrative offer. I even failed to mention that my co-worker and I shared my wife's video online. We obscured her boyfriend's face while exposing her own, and it went viral. I'd rather not be particular, but she's made it to the meme section, and the look on her face in the video always makes me chuckle. I couldn't even cry over this. I moved on as if nothing had happened because she had badly hurt and disrespected me in the previous few months. And the two things I couldn't tolerate from a woman were cheating and disrespect. I'm fine now, but I'm not in a hurry to start a relationship because most women are horrible pretenders. They are really good at saying I'll be a ride or die, but then they depart when something unexpected happens. Your wife has clearly been pretending since the beginning. She enjoyed her life with you and everything you did for her. It's always heartbreaking to give your all to someone and work so hard to make them comfortable and happy, only to realize when you meet them that you were in the relationship alone. You should be grateful that you found out before starting your new job, because otherwise you would have manipulated your soft heart again and taken advantage of your life. It's lovely to hear you've moved on. Enjoy your life and take your time before entering into any relationships. Story 3 here is my tale. Before being a relationship, my wife and I were always family and friends. Her mother was a close friend of my mother's, and we spent a lot of time at her house as children. My wife and I did not get along well as children because I used to tease her a lot, but once we were adults, things changed. Seeing her frequently helped me fall in love with her, and months later, we began dating. According to my wife, I was her first true love, and the rest of her college relationships were simply testing the waters. When we first started dating, we told our families about it, and they were supportive because she was not a stranger to them. However, prior to our marriage, we had a significant argument that nearly ended our relationship. So there's this cousin of mine who has been my rival since I was a kid. He was my maternal cousin and a few years older than me. My mother's younger sister had him when she was 16, but my mother waited until she was 21 to have me with my father. I'm not sure why, but my cousin and I were always fighting or struggling for something no matter how much our folks tried to force us. We never seemed to get along. He was also a low-key bully who continually bullied me, but he always acted properly when we were with our parents or any other adult present. 
My wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, made out with him at a family reunion, which nearly ended our relationship. We had, and when I contacted them, I was furious. She knew he was my opponent when she didn't push him away and he made advances on her. She let him kiss her, which nearly ended our relationship. It took almost three months for us to reconcile following that fight. That was when I looked at things from her perspective and recognized she was clearly under the effects of alcohol. Now that I've said it, I wish I had terminated things with her. Perhaps she wouldn't have given me so much sorrow all those years after my wife and I married. We relocated to the state where we worked and only visited our hometown on holidays and special occasions. We were both content with our lifestyles and had already lived below our means. We knew kids weren't in the picture yet, so we never talked about them. In the end, I did my best to be a good husband by supporting my wife financially, emotionally, and spiritually, as well as in other areas of her life when she needed it. Aside from our family, we were all my wife and I had. I was the type of person who only visited her parents on special events or invites, whereas my wife made every effort to visit our hometown at least twice a month. Her mother was very ill, and as the only child, she needed to go back and spend time with her. She spent some weekends seeing her mother. She would stay overnight and return on Sunday evenings. This way, she could spend time with her mother while also visiting my parents. My wife had been visiting her homeland the entire time. She never returned to tell me if she had seen any of my old pals or her own. She usually sounded as if the only people she saw were my family and her family, which was strange for someone who grew up in the same town as a dozen acquaintances and had lived there for nearly a year. My wife returned to our hometown twice a month, even after her mother recovered from her sickness. My wife did not cease visiting. She stated that she was lured to our town and enjoyed the ability to visit everyone while remaining connected to family. When she stated this, I should have guessed something was up, but I had no reason to distrust my wife because I trusted her and didn't believe she would betray me. By this point, we had been married for two years, and Urban had grown stronger. My parents renewed their wedding vows two months before Christmas since they had been married for 30 years and wanted to rekindle their love. As promised, my wife and I attended the party and arrived a day early to assist with some tasks. After the party, my wife advised that we stay at least one more day with our families, primarily because it had been a long time since I had visited. I agreed, and we attended the little family after party. My cousin, who had always been my competition for the title of beloved child in the family, was there to find out when I would remain. I invited some of my old pals to join me for a night of drinking. Later that night, as my friends and I were drinking, my cousin and a few others were conversing about various inconsequential topics. My cousin got intoxicated and started making a scene from his childhood. He'd always been a bragger around me. It was almost as if he wanted everyone to know he was doing better than me, despite the fact that he was born out of wedlock. My cousin immediately started creating a scene. My companion and I laughed out loud about an old memory and my cousin became attracted instead of continuing his drama and blabbing. He turned toward me and began to speak. He started assaulting me in my marriage, and when I didn't respond, he became enraged and began telling everyone how he had been sleeping with my wife. The first time he mentioned sleeping with my wife, I assumed he was just trying to get to me. But when he explained how she visited her hometown on weekends and how they had fun together, I knew he wasn't lying. At this moment, the only thing that felt natural was to capture him bragging. So I got out my phone and recorded him bragging and revealing his private data. My cousin even went so far as to suggest that he slept with my wife on purpose to prove to me that he could have whatever I had. I was extremely disappointed in my wife after hearing everything, and I couldn't disguise my embarrassment. When it appeared like his bragging would never end. I was compelled to leave everyone as soon as I entered my parents' house. I saw my wife talking to my parents and began yelling at her as well as my cousin and friends before leaving. I had already emailed the tape to my wife so she would know I was aware of her affair, but when she saw it, she warned me not to believe anything my cousin said because he was inebriated. I believed what my cousin claimed since he would not have said it if he hadn't slept with my wife. He would have simply bragged about something else. I was so outraged that I confronted her in front of my parents and after ranting and crying, she acknowledged in tears that she had inadvertently slept with my cousin, the person she knew I despised the most. My parents had to interfere and were really disappointed that my wife was cheating on me. 
Her mother, who was present in the room with my parents, was so disappointed in her that she left the house in shame. She also posted a recording of my intoxicated cousin on a WhatsApp family group chat, and everyone had now realized that he wasn't the good person they had previously assumed. That night, I couldn't sleep at home because I couldn't take the shame and embarrassment. So I drove to the nearest motel. My parents and wife continued phoning me all night, so I didn't answer any calls. The next day, I texted my mother that I was returning to the town where I resided and leaving my wife there. She also arrived home later that evening after I had packed my clothing and other possessions and left the house for her. When she called to ask where I was that evening, I informed her that our relationship was finished and that my lawyer would be the next person she heard from. I wasn't ready to listen to her explanations, so I blocked her phone number and all of our mutual social media accounts. Our divorce was traumatic for me, but I went ahead with it. We're divorced now and my family sees her differently. My mother and her mother are still friendly, but she is not allowed at her home. I've learned my lesson, and if I detect red flags in my future relationships, I won't try to rationalize them because a leopard never changes its spots anyway. Three years later, I still can't forget that night. It still haunts me while I sleep. My cousin and I will never be buddies, since he is no different than any other animal. Many things have changed in my family since everyone saw him brag on the video, and I am delighted with how they now regard him. A leopard never changes its spots. Cheating spouses will always cheat, and in your situation they may explain it as a mistake, even if it occurred multiple times. Your wife broke your confidence, which is inexcusable. She disgraced you, and you made the proper decision by removing her from your life. I'm pleased you didn't give her a third chance because you would have made a terrible mistake. It's wise to avoid your relative completely. He is unworthy to be called family. You need to forget about your wife and all that transpired. That is the only way to move on, and I hope you will do the right thing. Here is the next story. Tom Lynch sat quietly while waiting for the detective to begin. The man was reading a report and familiarizing himself with the known data. A woman sat beside him, staring across the table at Tom Lynch, but saying nothing at all. He closed the folder and spoke. I'm Pavel Jana, a detective sergeant in division. This is Detective Philip Tony. We'd like to chat to you regarding your wife's disappearance on the night of April 23rd this year. Why? Tom asked. I believed I had everything covered when I reported her missing to the Coast Guard, perhaps. However, there have been a few developments that they would not have known about when you described the situation, such as... What would you say about your relationship with your wife, Mr. Lynch? Fine. It was fantastic. We've been married 18 years and are still going strong. At least we were up until the accident. You were not having any problems, you know. Is your marriage having problems? No, not at all, he declared strongly. What is this about, detective? Do you know someone called Brandon Collings? Worth? No, should I? He is one of the senior accountants at Samples and knows where your wife worked. Are you certain you don't know him? Yes, I am sure. I didn't have many interactions with Veronica's business associates. She did not report to him. She reported to Marcel last year. They didn't have any social events that we would attend. This is mostly a business-oriented corporation. Again, detective, what is this all about? Jane groaned and leaned back in his chair, still staring at Thomas Lynch. We received an anonymous tip a few days ago that your wife and Mr. Collinsworth were having an affair. Apparently, it had been going on for some months. You have no idea about this? He asked with skepticism. Lynch struggled to say something. His shocked expression said it all. I do not believe it. An anonymous tip. What is the connection between this and her disappearance? Are you saying you didn't know your wife was having an affair with anyone? Yes. Heck, sure, Tom spit. I do not believe it. What proof have you got? For the first time, Detective Filipponi spoke. We conducted multiple interviews at your wife's office. More than one of them felt that something was going on between Collings, Worth, and Mrs. Lynch. She wouldn't ordinarily make contact with him. He worked in a different area and was several years her senior. Tom accused you of relying on office gossip. Not entirely, Mr. Lynch, Jane replied. We also interviewed Mr. Collings, Worth. It took some time, but when confronted with the rumors and the fact that he believed we had evidence, he eventually confirmed that they were seeing each other. What evidence? Tom inquired, his face pale and perplexed. The company has security cameras, and after randomly examining them over the last six months, 
we discovered multiple instances of the two of them becoming far more friendly than would be suitable in the office. I believe it is safe to assume that they were involved, at least in some way, and had been for several months. Tom Lynch's eyes turned glassy, and he shook his head slowly back and forth. I can't believe this. There was no hint, no sign. Why? He asked more of himself than the detectives. Janus shrugged, and Philippone remained motionless and expressionless as they continued to observe the man in depth. Tom raised his head to gaze at them both. Why am I here? Why are the RCMP involved in this? Mr. Lynch Filipponi believes this could be a suspicious death. Perhaps you discovered your wife's infidelity and decided to end your marriage. Divorce is considerably more expensive. That is ridiculous. First of all, I had no idea she was cheating on me. Second, I'm not a murderer. I might have divorced her. Or maybe she was going to divorce me, but I would not have killed her. That's what all the husbands say, Filipponi explained. But sometimes rage can overtake common sense and bad things happen. You read about it in the papers almost every week. So are you saying I am now a suspect in the disappearance of my wife? Lynch asked aggressively. No, not at this time, Jane replied quietly. We just want to go over the facts with you once more. I understand you provided the Coast Guard with a detailed report, but we'd like to record your comment here for our records. Tom Lynch sat silently, staring at the two detectives. His mind was racing, and he was clearly uncomfortable. All right, one more time. However, if you want to speak with me after this, my lawyer will be present. Keep this in mind, he said. Vanished, nodded Philip. Tony rose and went to the water cooler, returning with two cups of cold water, placing one in front of each of the two men before returning to get one for herself. Jane opened the file in front of him and passed several pages to his partner. Tom noticed that the top page featured Coast Guard letterhead. It was a copy of the statement he gave the morning after the accident. He exhibited no sign of anxiety. We were entered in the Southern Streets competition, as we had been for the previous six years, Tom explained. This year the weather was supposed to be rough, but not anywhere near as rough as it turned out to be. My boat is well equipped with radar and GPS. Plus, both Veronica and I had plenty of experience in terrible weather, so I wasn't too afraid. We took turns at the wheel with four hours on and four hours off. I set it up so that I took the midnight to 4 a.m. keep an eye on things while Veronica sleeps. In fact, I didn't plan to wake her unless she woke up herself. I had coffee in a thermos and some energy bars to keep me going. Shortly after I took over, the storm became more severe and I could see on the radar that it would be stronger than expected. I checked the reports from the various light stations on the marine radio and they confirmed that it would be a rough night. I put my survival suit on and hooked up my tether just in case. I left Veronica's suit at the bottom of the companionway so that she wouldn't come on deck without it. That was ordinary operating procedure for us. Everything was fine until shortly before 2 a.m. I had been feeling poorly since midnight, but now I was having internal cramps. They felt like bowel cramps. I've had these before, or if I've had some poisoned meal. But these were getting worse. I knew I wouldn't make it until 4 a.m. without relief, so I pushed the alarm bell for Veronica to let her know I needed her right away. Five minutes later, she was on deck wearing her survival suit. I described the problem, and she instantly took over, ordering me not to return until I was well. I made it to the head and relieved myself. Whatever was irritating me had caused me to have diarrhea, and it took some time to get rid of it. I could hear a thumping on the deck. I assumed something had come loose and was making the commotion. I was sure Veronica wouldn't leave the helm until I returned. So I washed myself up as best I could and suited up to go back up on deck. When I reached the cockpit, there was no trace of her. I switched on the huge deck light and called her name, but there was no answer. How long were you absent from the cockpit? Janice asked. I'm not sure, maybe 15, 20 minutes, no more carry on. The detective noted the boat was on self-steering, which was unusual. We hardly use that while we are in terrible weather. The noise I heard was from the inflatable. One of the oars had come out of its cradle, as I heard below. I went down again to be sure Veronica hadn't gone to the other head or into one of the cabins, but there was no sign of her. I guess I was shocked. It hadn't fully dawned on her that she had gone too far. It took me a few minutes to decide what to do. I dropped our little sail and started the engine. I circled back the direction we had come, using the GPS plotter to chart my course. 
I switched on the deck light again and started calling her name. I knew it was futile, but I needed to do something. While driving, I placed a distress call to the Coast Guard and explained what had transpired. I am sure they will have a recording of it. I moved back and forth across the area. I suspected she had fallen in, but there was no indication of her among the waves and wind at the moment. I'd have had to be quite lucky to spot her. As time passed, I began to lose hope. She could survive for a time with her survival gear, but given the water temperature, I doubt we'd be able to find her alive. When the Coast Guard cutter arrived just before 4 a.m., I was already in a state of panic. They checked my GPS to confirm the location of her disappearance and began their own search, but simply chatting to them made me realize that there was no hope. I'd lost her. She had somehow fallen overboard and disappeared. Your wife's body has never been located. Philippone? She inquired, knowing the answer. Tom Lynch shook his head, staring regretfully at the two police investigators. Is there anything else you can think of that might help us resolve this case? Janice asked. No, I am as perplexed as you are about the cheating issue. I can't see how it's related to her disappearance. As I previously indicated, Philippone suggested that an upset husband may seek vengeance on a wayward wife if she intends to leave you for her lover. Perhaps you realized how awful you'd come out of the divorce. She would receive half of everything, including your business. So if you weren't aware of the two of them, you'd have a strong motivation. No. How many times do I need to tell you? I knew nothing about her affair. I didn't have any cause to kill her. It was just an accident. A catastrophic and awful accident. The two detectives sat silently, watching the distraught guy in front of them. Was he saying the truth? They possessed no proof to the contrary but he had a motive. If he was aware of his wife's infidelity, was it a coincidence that she went missing without a trace? They learned not to believe in coincidences. That's it for now. Mr. Lynch will contact you if we need to speak with you again. In the meanwhile, if you have any plans to leave town, please let us know. This file is not yet closed. Tom Lynch stood fiercely facing the two. If I come down here again, I will bring my lawyer with me. I'm not going to be your personal whipping boy as you try to add two and two equal five. With that, he turned and left the interview room. The pneumatic seal prevented him from slamming the door as hard as he intended to. What are your thoughts? asked his partner. I do not know. It actually depends on whether he was aware of her cheating on him, doesn't it? I suppose that's what we have to find out. Did he know? Jane nodded. Any situation depended on just one question. He'd lost Veronica almost three months ago. Three months of chaos. The grief process comes first. Then, a month ago, she revealed that she had an affair with someone at her office. What is his name? Collingwood. Hollingsworth. He had realized why the police were interested in him. He would have a motivation if he was aware of her affair. It brought an end to his internal grief. Veronica's parents were heartbroken. Of course, losing their firstborn daughter was extremely painful, and they had yet to recover from the blow. Tom, they blamed him for the accident, and he felt their distance from him. Veronica's younger sister, Connie, has been his sole source of support in recent weeks. She had always been a close friend and had a crush on Tom as a teenager. She was seven years younger than her sister, but at 33, she was a brilliant, self-sufficient young woman with her own thriving interior design firm. Tom's mother was upset by Veronica's death, but not to the amount Tom had imagined. She had realized that the accident was simply an unfortunate and unforeseen tragedy. This was the second time they had lost a family member. Tom's father died six years ago while on a business trip to China. He had been robbed and murdered near his hotel in Shanghai. The three men were swiftly apprehended, prosecuted, convicted, and killed. It had provided little comfort to Marion, Lynch, or Tom, their only child or Tom's relatives, at the age of 32. Tom Lynch had been appointed president and CEO of Lynchpin Plastics. With Veronica's death, his mother focused all of her devotion on him and her grandchildren, believing they needed her support and love. Tom hadn't decided what to do about his future. Vern and Tony, twins, were in their final year of high school. Vern was applying for an academic scholarship at a local university, while Tony intended to study plastics technology at a nearby technical college. Tony viewed himself as his father's natural partner at Lynchpin. The two boys seemed to be coping their mother's death better than their father. 
Tom had not told anyone about his wife's infidelity or the police interrogation, and he saw no reason to share what he had been told. They held a memorial service for Veronica three weeks after she went missing. A plaque was set in a shaded spot in a park near her parents' home. After a modest service for the immediate family led by their local preacher, her father appreciated the gesture. But Veronica's mother remained distant and chilly toward Tom. Only her grandchildren experienced her love and sadness. Connie had acquired the habit of seeing Tom on weekends, knowing he had not touched the yachts in the tragedy. She tried to persuade him to go, whether with her, the boys, or both, but he refused. He pondered aloud whether you should sell the linchpin lady. But the boys and Connie made such a fuss over it that he dropped the issue. And so it sat. Forty-six fired, a fiberglass antique, rocks softly on its dock in Fisherman's Cove. Tom was grateful to have his business. It required concentration, which pulled his focus away from Veronica and his other concerns. Lynchpin Plastic specializes in hard plastic containers made from pet polyethylene terephthalate. It was previously found in soft drink juice and water bottles, but it is now used virtually universally as a substitute for both glass and metal cans. Tom's father saw early on that the soft drink and water industry was way too competitive for a local, medium-sized converter like his, so he searched in several directions. Pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, specialist food products, and other segmented market prospects were the focus, and the company benefited from his insight. Tom had just followed in his father's footsteps, focusing on markets where they could make a profit. Tom employed an old acquaintance and college classmate as a sales manager. Brian Edgar, like Tom, was 40 years old and married with two children, Shania, 11, and Ronnie, 9. His wife, Virginia, was an old college buddy. They had begun their family much later than Tom and Veronica, but they were dedicated parents and wonderful friends. Brian and Tom agreed on their company approach. They worked closely together to identify new prospects and goods. If Tom's father could have seen him now, he would have been extremely proud of him and where he had brought Lynchpin. Even though Tom hadn't seen the beautiful lady since the accident, he still sought safety at the yacht club, the clubhouse dining room and bar. He was highly known and liked in the club. His father had been Commodore for two terms, and Tom was expected to follow in his footsteps. The spectacular and deadly occurrences during the Southern Straits race had put a stop to that. Nonetheless, he felt at ease in his surroundings and frequently invited the lads to join him for dinner. Tom stopped by the club on a Friday evening in mid-July, exhausted from another long week at the plant. He'd invited the boys to meet him there, but Tony had arrangements with his present girlfriend, so only Verna would accompany him. He had been there for nearly a half hour, sipping a scotch and soda, when he noticed Vern enter the dining room. He had a guest as well. Connie Fairley was following close after. Hello, Dad. I didn't think you would mind if Aunt Connie joined us because Tony couldn't make it. Tom, could you kindly tell your son not to refer to me as Aunt Connie? She complained. It makes me feel old. Verna, please respect your aunt's wishes, so I should simply name her Connie, he asked cautiously. Sure, or baby, or hot stuff. Tom started laughing, and the three of them joined in. Tom couldn't recall laughing in a long time. Don't you dare, Vernon Lynch, she said, prodding him in the chest with her finger. In more formal situations, you may address me as Connie or Miss Fairley. Vern shrugged, looked at his father, and smiled. There hadn't been many happy moments for any of them in the previous three months. Friday night was fish and seafood night in the dining room, and they each ordered a different meal. The meal was usually expertly cooked and presented, and that evening was no exception. The talk was lighthearted and enthusiastic until the dessert plate was brought to the table. Connie and Tom declined. However, Vern chose a New York cheesecake that was huge enough for all three of them. Their waiter witnessed the reaction and smiled as he gave three forks. I need to quit eating here, Tom muttered, reclining back in his chair. I'll be 300 pounds if I don't. Nonsense, Connie responded promptly. You remain the hunk you were when you were dating my sister. Woo-hoo, Vern replied with a smirk. Guess who has a crush on Dad? Tom said. Be careful, young man. You're on perilous ground. This is a family gathering, not an adolescent bull session. Don't get all bent out of shape, Tom. Vern did not mean anything by it, did he? No, sure. I didn't mean to upset you, Dad. He seemed really concerned. I am not unhappy, but some issues are not appropriate for public consumption. Tom spoke slowly, all the while glancing at Connie. Party pooper. 
Connie grinned. Now, Connie, don't lead my boy astray. I'm trying to raise both of them to be proper guys. Good luck with it. She laughed. Vern wasn't far behind, snorting his own coffee as it was served. Vern turned to Tom and inquired, Is it okay if you drive Connie to our place, Dad? She left her car there, and I had a date in another half hour. I did not want to rush you. That is okay. Don't be late, but have fun, Tom remarked with a smile as Vern excused himself and exited the dining room. Connie turned to face Tom. Tom, you have raised two wonderful young men. You must be quite proud. I have to give Veronica a lot of credit. She led them along. And you're correct. I'm quite proud of them. They will leave the nest one of these days, soon. What are you going to do then? Connie asked. I do not know. I haven't truly considered it. Downsize, I suppose. Maybe a condominium. I might even live with the lady. You have not been aboard since the disaster, have you? No, I can't seem to generate any enthusiasm. I'm sure the boys would enjoy going out with you. So would I. I enjoy that boat almost as much as you do. I really don't want to go out by myself, Connie. I don't think I can handle it. You do not need to. I am always available to crew with you. I know my way around it fairly well. Yes, you do, right? So perhaps I should take her out. She's probably lonely sitting there without moving for the past three months. Here you go, talking as if it were a living being. That is more like the Tom I know. She smiled faintly. I will check her out tomorrow, and we can go out on Sunday if you like. Why aren't we doing that now? There's still enough light, and if everything goes well, we can spend the weekend together. We only need an overnight bag. Tom took a careful look at Connie. They'd progressed from a simple comment to her request that they spend the weekend together on the boat. How did things be pushed so far? Did he wonder? Can I trust you to be a decent girl? He grinned. Absolutely not. She soon responded with a large smile. Vern was correct. I have a thing for my brother-in-law. I've had it since I was 14. I will not try to deceive you about that. I suppose I always knew that. But I was not going to take advantage of you. And then... Then I was married and every other lady was off bounds. You took your vows seriously, didn't you? She inquired with a furrowed brow. Her voice lacked comedy. Yes, of course. This is why they are called vows. I would never break them. Connie reclined back in her chair, her gaze focused on her cup rather than Tom. Why don't we check out the boat? Tom spoke, breaking the silence. Yes, let's go. They were approaching the port entrance's locked gate. Just a minute. Tom inserted his card into the slot and opened the steel mesh door, allowing Connie to follow suit. She brushed up against him as she passed, but she didn't look back or claim it was an accident. He saw her stroll down the gangway and onto the floating dock, straight to the berthing space for the tugboat. Lady Constance Fairley was single and had never married. She claimed she had never found the right man, although Veronica frequently commented that she wasn't looking hard enough. She had graduated from her local community college's interior design course. She had previously worked for a well-known developer to gain experience before striking out on her own at the age of 27. Surprisingly, she had been successful virtually since the beginning. Six years later, he was well-established and appeared to be in good financial shape. Her sister, Veronica, had been thin and tall, well-proportioned but not voluptuous. Her beauty stemmed from how she presented herself. She was very aware of her appearance, making sure not to overdo it with makeup or clothing. She was a certified accountant, but had stopped working when the boys were born. When the boys were 13 years old, she returned to work at her previous job at Samples in Red, content with being a stay-at-home mother. She seemed content with her job and told Tom so several times, but she didn't appear to socialize with anyone there. However, this was not so shocking. Veronica was not an extroverted person by nature. Their friends were people they had known for a while, and Tom was careful to introduce any new people to Kate before suggesting they create a closer friendship. Connie was very different from her sister, not as tall but more robust, voluptuous. Tom considered more than once. She was a stunning woman with a dazzling personality. Tom wished Veronica were as vibrant as her sister. On the other hand, he was completely satisfied with his marriage, and put any feelings of unhappiness behind him as they grew older. At 40, he was beginning to believe he was too young to give up on life. If he decided to look for another mate, he would be quite selective. 
Tom Lynch was, by all accounts, a gorgeous man, standing six feet tall with dark brown hair and medium build. He exercised consistently, and it showed. His face was characterized by dark brown eyes, a natural smile, and a year-round tan from sailing. Many ladies envied Tom Lynch's wife. He was intelligent, successful, and likable. It only took Tom a few minutes to realize that everything on the yacht was in working order. The fresh water tanks were empty, thanks to the maintenance personnel who were employed to help maintain the boats at the club's marina. Diesel fuel was nearly three-quarters full. The batteries were charged, and the radar, GPS, and radio were all operational. He left instructions for the maintenance manager to monitor the water. A quick stop in the morning for food and beverages would round out the preparations. As he laid in bed that night, he thought about Connie. He pondered what others would think if he started dating his late wife's sister. It was too early. Of course, it wasn't horrible, but it had an unusual vibe about it that he couldn't pinpoint. Perhaps he still thought of her as the scrawny youngster with braces and an uncomfortable demeanor. She had surely passed through that stage with flying colors. He wasn't bothered by the fact that they were going out with the lady for the weekend. Connie had often accompanied the family on weekend getaways. She and Veronica constituted an excellent crew and worked well as a team. When he got home that evening, he left a letter for Vern and Tony explaining that he was taking the lady out for the weekend and invited them to join him. He packed a few stuff into an overnight bag in preparation for the weekend. Strangely, despite his reluctance to be near the boat, he was looking forward to getting back on it. He went to bed that night with a confusion of ideas, which kept him awake for a while. He awoke with a start the next morning. He gradually realized that someone was ringing the doorbell. He looked up and realized it was just 7 p.m. Who the heck was at his door at this hour on a Saturday morning? He climbed out of bed, slipping a pair of jeans over his briefs and walking barefoot down the stairs to the front door. He opened the door to see Connie standing there, dressed for sailing and smiling brightly. What exactly are you doing here at this awful hour? He croaked. Come on, Tom. The sun is up and time is running out. She chirped. So come in. I need to get dressed and tidy up. Make some coffee, please. Sure. Don't forget to pack an overnight bag, he grumbled, having already finished. Connie moved rapidly around the kitchen as Tom went to the bedroom and then the bathroom. He was showered and shaved in fifteen minutes, dressed for the day, and carried his suitcase to the front door. Neither of the lads had stirred, and he assumed they had arrived extremely late. "'Have you seen this?' Connie inquired, holding out Tom's note to the lads. "'No, what does it say? It says to have a good time and behave.' "'T and V,' she smirked. It looks like it will be just you and me for the next two days. He nodded with a slight smile. He lifts his first coffee of the day. He grumbled as he went to the store to get some groceries. Nope, I looked after it last night on the way home. She stated, clearly proud of her foresight. Good. Tom nodded reluctantly. When is the high tide? Right about now. So we should have a simple exit. A low tide at a congested marina, such as Fisherman's Cove, always made entry and leave difficult for larger craft like the lady. Fortunately, Tom's father had reserved a berth large enough and near the channel for the 46-foot motor sailor when he first bought it years ago. There has been a more than 10-year wait for that size space today. Connie drove them to the yacht club in her SUV, merrily chatting all the way. Tom sipped a second coffee, attempting to clear the cobwebs from his abrupt awakening. The groceries and supplies were neatly organized, with perishables in a cooler and dry goods in a well-worn tote. They stowed their overnight bags onto a cart and headed to their berth in the chilly morning sunshine. Connie expertly slipped the lines while Tom carefully navigated out of their tight position with the bow thruster. The powerful diesel rumbled beneath their feet, slowly turning the large bronze propeller as they eased out toward the open waters of Georgia Strait. There was little wind, but because they had no specific destination in mind, Tom kept the engine running as he sought for signs of wind out on the road. "'Where do you want to go?' he asked as they stood together in the cockpit. She said, "'Somewhere sunny, warm, and private,' and looked at him with satisfaction. Tom gave her a grin. Her motivations are clear to him. He had known Connie for twenty years. He was aware of her attraction for him. At first it was awkward.' 
When he married Veronica and Connie, he was 14 years old and had a crush on a 21-year-old woman. He almost wanted to avoid being alone with her. Veronica giggled when he said it to her. Either she didn't notice it or decided to ignore it. Now, everything was different. They were both single, and it had started up again just a week after he returned from that fateful weekend. She started stopping in to make sure he was okay. She would fuss over the boys despite the fact that they could handle the most of their own requirements. She did the dishes and prepared supper for them, hired a housekeeper to keep the premises clean, and made sure the boys trimmed the grass and washed the automobiles. This came after she had spent the entire week running her own business. To be honest, Tom did not mind at all. Connie was her normal, cheery self, which was especially important given what had happened. Tom saved his reminiscences for quiet times, generally at night. It was lonely being alone in their bed. He was almost upset when the sheets were changed after he arrived home, and he couldn't smell Veronica's aroma on them. They had hardly been apart. Tom attended trade shows on occasion, but generally with Veronica. He attended the two largest plastics and equipment exhibits in Chicago and Dusseldorf on a regular basis, accompanied by Brian and his wife, Virginia. If they were looking for new equipment, he might include his production manager as well. If he could get away, Tony would join him to the November performance in Chicago. His thoughts turned back to the chat with the investigators. He still couldn't believe Veronica would have an affair with one of her senior bosses. She had done an excellent job of concealing it. Unfortunately for her, it was not perfect. Others knew and others spoke. He came to the decision that the affair was real and had to be accepted as such. A penny. Connie replied, rushing to his side. It brought Tom back to the present. Oh, sorry, nothing, just remembering. He lied. Tom, it is time to quit grieving. Your sons did. Even my parents have come to terms with the loss. I know it must be painful, but you have many years to live, and they can be happy years if you want them to. He nodded. I think you're correct, Connie. Is that what this weekend is about? He inquired with a faint frown. Yes, that is exactly what this is all about. You are a youthful, virile, and robust man in the prime of his life. What has occurred to you is a terrible accident for which you are not accountable. It occurs to all families all the time. I know it's difficult, but each day will get better. You know you can rely on me to assist in any way I can. She concluded with a sweet but serious tone. Yes, I can, right? You've been a rock, Connie. I apologize if I haven't mentioned it before, but your presence has been extremely helpful and comforting. Thank you. She grinned in acknowledgement, wrapping one arm over his back and giving him a warm hug. Have you determined where we're going? She inquired after a pause. I assumed we'd head south to Satana, perhaps anchor in Winter Cove overnight. Oh, terrific, she exclaimed eagerly. I adore that sight. Then it's settled, he said. Why don't you take the wheel for a while and I'll get some coffee and cookies. I purchased some Danish for us. Danish, he agreed as he moved toward the companionway. A quick look around revealed that the wind was finally building up from the northwest, as planned, and they could set sail after they had finished their coffee. Tom's father had bought the 46 for Hunter from a desperate business associate when his divorce became a heavy burden. He then set about restoring and repainting it to meet modern electrical and comfort specifications. There were many weekends spent on the water with his father and mother, Tom and Veronica, the two sons, and the linchpin woman. The cockpit housed all of the sail controls and was fully canvas enclosed for rough weather. The boat showed itself the night Veronica went missing when, despite severe seas, Tom was able to handle it and keep on track while searching for her. More than three months later, he was remembering that night again. What could he have done differently to save his wife? What if he had? What if it was her affair? Confusion on top of doubt, on top of remorse. He returned to the cockpit with a tray containing two cups, a thermos jug of freshly made coffee, creamer and sugar, and two of the Danish pastries that Connie had given. They drank and ate in companionable silence, admiring the view before them. They were heading west via Georgia before turning south to the Gulf Islands. Ferry and other traffic was common throughout the summer months so they had to be continuously aware of it. When they had finished their coffee and food, the two of them proceeded to race, first with the Genoa and then with the main sail. They were a practice team that had gone through the drill numerous times before. 
Powered winches made quick work of raising and setting the huge foresail and mainsail. The 14 afterbeam would limit cruising speed to roughly eight knots, but it wasn't designed to be a racer, but rather a cruiser with all of the amenities. It was ideal for their purposes. The wind hadn't risen up to the forecast 15 to 20 knots yet, but they were moving along nicely, with only a light chop breaking up the otherwise smooth surface. Sunglasses and sunscreen were required as they sailed into the bright reflection on the sea. They took turns at the helm, with Connie being equally as confident as Tom due to her many hours on the water over the years. Veronica had always welcomed her along whenever she was available, and Tom was always delighted to have her on board. She never failed to pitch in and assist with work on deck and in the galley. It was late afternoon when they arrived at Winter Cove on Staten Island. It was a familiar place, and they immediately realized that their preferred anchoring spot was available. After dropping the sail and motoring into the big bay, Tom checked the depth sounder for the spot where he wished to anchor. He knew there would be plenty of water beneath them, even at low tide. The land and trees gave shelter from a westerly, although the wind was expected to die down by dusk. Tom managed the anchor, and Connie made the set according to his instructions. It was an ideal bottom for a large vessel such as the Lady. When he was satisfied that they were fully hooked, he signaled Connie to turn off the engine. The hush that ensued always astounded them. There are no automobiles or trucks, no railroads and very few airplanes. The jet ski throng had retired for supper so they could enjoy the calm they sought. What did you choose for our lunch, Connie? Nothing fancy. She said, pork and beans on a paper plate with a straight face. You liar, he laughed. Okay, come on. What did you receive? She admits to having a variety of cold cuts, cheese, coleslaw, freshly made bread, and two nice huge lemon tarts. He mumbled, that sounds like healthy food to me. Anyway, I trust you won't starve us, so I'll leave you to it. Are there any particular wines you'd like? Do you still have the wonderful Spanish red? What was it? Castillo? Something? Yep, I'll open it now. I had a bottle of Beaujolais with a few glasses remaining in it. Want to get started on that? Sure, I'll prepare the food while you set up the table, she volunteered. They would eat at the back of the cockpit, savoring the last of the sun's warmth in the peaceful cove. The table was stored in a locker at the stern and needed only a minute to assemble. He went into the galley to get the open bottle of French red from the cooler, then removed the cork from the Spanish red to allow it to breathe. He poured the remaining two glasses of Beaujolais and gave one to Connie. They silently touched the glass as a salute. Connie had underestimated her food choices. The various meats and cheeses were an excellent complement to the wine. They couldn't possibly eat everything and there'd be plenty left over for a quick lunch tomorrow. I'm so delighted you decided to do this, Tom. Go sailing? Yes, that, and invite me along. As I recall, this was entirely your idea, he said with a pinched brow. Would you have gone if I hadn't recommended I come along? He glanced at her for a moment before returning his attention to his plate. No, I suppose not. Any regrets thus far? He looked up and smiled. No, none. Connie shrugged and returned to eating her lemon dessert. Tom was only picking at his. He had eaten more than usual and had no hunger left. They were well into their first glass of Spanish wine. There hadn't been much talk, but it was neither unpleasant nor uncomfortable. They'd known each other for too long to have to keep the other interested in what they had to say. On the other hand, they were rarely afraid to express their thoughts. Tom, do you know what the five phases of grief are? He gazed at her again, his face furrowed. Where was this going? Yeah, I have heard of them. I don't recall them offhand. Denial, rage, bargaining, despair, and acceptance, she explained, on an emotional level. Okay, yes, I remember now. Why are you asking? Isn't this obvious? Where are you now? Which step are you on? I have not given it much thought. There's no point in denying that Veronica's gone. That is real enough. I felt angry with myself for allowing it to happen. I blamed myself and contemplated what I could have done better. I'm not sure about bargaining, but depression was surely present. I think I'm getting through it, but it seems like a long path. Every time I see or hear something that reminds me of her, the pain persists. So you're almost done then, she inquired as she was almost ready to accept. It's not that simple, Connie. There are other things, things I have learned about us, things that alter everything. Connie initially appeared confused, then it turned into amazement. 
Did she cheat on you? She said fiercely. He stared at his sister-in-law. How could she have arrived at that conclusion so swiftly and easily? He shakes his head, not in denial, but surprised by her statement. She did, right? Connie reiterated. He nodded and said nothing. That is selfish. Stupid, egotistical jerk, she spat. How did you find out? Look, Connie, I do not want this to come out, especially among our two families. They do not need to know. It would be extremely harmful to those we care about, and she's gone now. So what is the point? I know I don't want to hurt them either. I believe my mother would have a heart attack and your boys would be devastated. Tom nodded, gathering his thoughts and wondered if telling Connie was the appropriate thing. She had guessed what her sister had done, but she now wanted to find out more. He would have to be careful with his response. I was called in for an interview at the RCMP headquarters. It was supposed to bring their accident report to a close. I wasn't there long before the questioning about what happened that night resumed from the beginning. They asked me to describe the events, and I could tell they were comparing my responses to the statement I gave the Coast Guard that night. Soon, one of the officers asked if I knew Mr. So-and-so. I don't remember his name. It turns out he was a senior manager at the office where Veronica worked. I had never heard of him, so that's what I told them. I couldn't believe it. They wanted to know if I was aware that my wife was having an affair with this man. Things went downhill from there. I was in a daze, unable to accept that Veronica would cheat on me. Someone had apparently given the police information about the affair, but no charges were leveled against me. Just that both of them were really palsy. The police interviewed this man, and after some tough questions, he admitted to the affair. It had gone on for several months. Oh, God, Connie groaned. How could she? I can't believe she would do something so stupid to you. Yeah, it was a shock to me. I can tell you I had no clue. None. Meanwhile, the detectives were investigating if I was aware of the situation and had done anything to Veronica. Connie looked shocked, but sat silently wondering what to say. In the end, she simply shook her head. I guess that explains why you've had such a tough time getting past what happened. He nodded. Yes. Not only do I not know what happened to her that night, I don't know why she felt the need to cheat on me, on the boys, on all of us again. Connie sat silently, almost about to say something, but stopping at the last second. Finally, she spoke. Tom, my sister, has always been a self-absorbed, selfish jerk. Before you were around, we were constantly at each other's throats. I don't know why she despised me, but she did. Maybe it was because I was an unanticipated accident. I came along long after her, and I got a lot of attention from Mom and Dad. Perhaps she felt envious of that. I don't know, but whatever the cause, she and I didn't get along for the longest time, and I was just stubborn enough not to accept any of her crap, especially when I became older. When you appeared, I could practically see her thoughts working. You were a catch. You were supposed to inherit your father's business eventually and be a somebody. It didn't hurt that you were handsome, polite, attractive, intelligent, and well-educated. And, oh, did I say handsome and sexy? She stated it with a tinge of black humor. Tom couldn't help chuckling. She wasn't expressing any well-kept secrets about how she saw him at that young age. I was helpless, too young for you and not particularly attractive at that point in my growth, but miracle of marvels, you treated me well. You never disregarded or made fun of me. Can you image how that boosted my ego? You were Prince Charming, but I was about to lose you to the Wicked Witch of West Vancouver. I can't count how many times I wept myself to sleep, wishing I was 18 and pretty instead of 14 and hideous. She stopped making fun of me as I grew older. She had you and the lifestyle she desired. And I was not a threat to her. Tom objected. You were never ugly. You simply hadn't grown into your physique yet. Braces and acne were both transitory. I remember seeing your portrait, which your parents had done for your 16th birthday. You were really gorgeous back then, and nothing has changed. You've just gotten more lovely throughout the years. It's all the more remarkable that no one has grabbed you and taken you away. She gave him a long, hard stare. You don't understand, do you? She said somberly. I was waiting for you. I was waiting for Veronica to screw up before making my move. Every time I went out with another person, I would compare him to you. None of them matched up. None of them were ever going to compare to you. Tom sat back down again a puzzled and confused expression on his face. He let out a big sigh and leaned back into the cushions of the bench. 
You'd waited 20 years for your sister to make a mistake. She nodded. Stupid. Talk about futility. Veronica was never going to make a mistake if she could avoid it. You were too good to let go of after your father died. She thought she had hit the jackpot as time passed. She was even more convinced she had. You gave her exactly what she wanted. New car? Sure. A big house. Not an issue. Vacation in Europe. When should we go? And the more you provided her, the more she came to take you for granted. I never knew, Tom said. I suppose I believed I was just giving her what she deserved for being a faithful wife and excellent mother. I didn't have anything to complain about. We experienced love on a regular basis. There were no mystery late-night gatherings or out-of-town conferences. She didn't grumble about the lengthy hours I put in when we were developing new products. I never got a hint that something was wrong. The only thing wrong was Veronica. Tom. She got all she asked for, but it wasn't enough. I told you she was selfish when she ran out of things to ask you for. She probably felt she could have a lover and consider it just another gain. You didn't think very highly of your sister, did you? He said sadly, No, I didn't. Part of it was jealousy. She had you, but I didn't. Part of it was annoyance, as I could see her taking advantage of you. And now there's some rage involved, because she cheated you without reason. Even as a teenager, I knew she was going to do something like this. I've never envied her for anything other than being with you. And now she is gone. Tom murmured, staring at her intently. Yes, she is gone but I am still here and I have no idea what to do about it. Tom slumped back again, closing his eyes. It's too early, Connie. It's too soon for me to wrap my brain around the future. I admit that I am also attracted to you. When I am alone and reflecting on my life with Veronica, now I'm picking it apart, looking for things I disliked or didn't feel good about. Now that I know, it feels like I'm weakening the core of all of my views about my marriage, and I don't like how it's affecting me. Maybe I'm in need of therapy. I've also been thinking about it. Are you serious? Do you genuinely believe you need professional assistance? She asked incredulously. I do not know. I might just go see what a doctor thinks. I'm not eager to do it, but I need to get my life back on track. Sooner or later, I have the guys to think about. The plan to run, among other things. She moved next to him and hugged him tightly. I am sorry, Tom. I did not intend to unload all of this on you right now. I had no idea what my sister had done to you. Now I'm the one being selfish. I'll back off till you're more comfortable with it. I have waited this long. A little longer won't make a difference. She spoke regretfully. Tom threw his arm around Connie, squeezing her against him. He was unsure about his feelings for her. Was it love or something else? Was it too soon or was he repressing his feelings for her? He needed to get those things straight in his mind before doing something that could have devastating effects. They drank the bottle of wine and sat quietly on the bench in the stern, not close enough to touch, yet not too far apart. The stars had begun to show, and the occasional satellite moved slowly across the sky. It always amazed him to watch a man-made object hundreds of kilometers in the emptiness of space, perpetually orbiting Earth. It would be one of literally hundreds of light gadgets, some in stationary orbit, watching and photographing us unnoticed by the naked eye. The cove was peaceful, as it usually is at night. Every now and then, a jet from Vancouver International would soar overhead, heading somewhere unknown. The lights are blazing against the black sky. The birds had retired, but the insects were still active, so it was time to close the cockpit and descend. They would get up early tomorrow morning like they always did, not wanting to waste another bright summer day. Tom slept in the forward stateroom, while Connie picked the aft guest stateroom. There were two staterooms aft, divided by a modesty screen, and Tom's father had cleverly built another bunk by making the galley tabletop tilt. They could comfortably sleep seven people, but have rarely done so in recent years. It was usually five people, including Tom and Veronica, the boys, and sometimes Connie. On Sunday, sunrise was at 530 a.m., and the brightness in the cabin awakened Tom up shortly after. He laid in his bunk, knowing he wouldn't be able to sleep, wearing only a t-shirt and underwear. He took some fresh underwear from his luggage and proceeded to the forward head, starting his morning routine. This head was the only one with a shower, so he took use of it shaving and showering right away. 
Connie was standing in the galley wearing a translucent dressing gown, busy pouring the coffee, knowing she wouldn't be in her bunk for long when he entered the cramped facility. Good morning, he remarked, smiling. Hi, sleep well? Yes, I did, thanks. You okay? I suppose, she answered, noncommittal. We got into some serious stuff last night, I believe that was on my thoughts. Sorry to hear this, I didn't mean to drop that on you. I know, but I'm grateful you told me. Nobody else needed to know, but I did. Thanks. Sure. Do you want to use the shower? Yeah. Thanks, she remarked, slipping out of the cramped galley and into the lounge. Tom noticed the silhouette of her visibly nude torso through the thin material of her gown and felt an immediate reaction to it. He'd seen Connie in a small bikini before. She liked to tease him, and he was always surprised that Veronica didn't seem to mind. Perhaps she knew him well enough to know he would never take advantage of her sister's offer. With Veronica gone, his inhibitions were reduced, possibly to a vulnerable degree. He knew she wouldn't want a large breakfast, so he'd let her choose between cereal, toast, or another Danish from the pantry. Tom was used to cereal, so he poured himself a big bowl of bran flakes, covered it with raisins, and added milk. It would keep him content until lunchtime. She was almost as tall as her sister at five feet eight, but much more solidly built. Thomas felt she got her build from her father, whereas Veronica received it from her mother. Whatever the source, she was a stunning figure, and few, if any, men would pass her by without casting a passionate look. Her blonde hair was chopped short, reaching barely the base of her neck. Her lovely blue eyes complemented her slightly freckled face and magnificent teeth. Her nose was slightly larger than ideal, but it didn't look out of place on an otherwise stunning face. Tom always wondered if Veronica had envied her sister. He didn't believe Connie when she told him about their tumultuous childhood. Connie blossomed into the gorgeous young woman she would become only after Tom and she married. He was relieved that the two sisters had resolved their hostility. It would have made life tough for everyone if it had continued. Veronica was stunning in her own exquisite manner. Connie was the lovely, outgoing sibling who frequently drove guys insane when they couldn't pique her interest in them. Perhaps it was the wicked smirk on her lips as she passed by, glancing quickly at him. Perhaps it was only his imagination. Maybe not. He finished his cereal, washed the bowl in the sink, and placed it on the drain rack, joining yesterday night's small collection of plates and cutlery. Tom and Connie both appreciated the boat's minimalist aesthetic. There was a dishwasher, but it was designed for greater quantities than they would use over the weekend. He poured another cup of coffee just as Connie appeared from the stateroom clad in a very snug, sleeveless t-shirt and equally tight shorts. Will you be warm enough in that? he inquired, unable to hide his grin. I'll layer up if I need to, she responded, raising an eyebrow. That way, whatever is applied can be easily removed. Tom shook his head, wondering if she'd wear anything more than deck shoes if she didn't have to. According to the weather forecast, the day will be warm. Thus, sunscreen was needed. Connie was wearing very little. She'd need a large, economy-sized container to protect her exposed skin. He was thinking about how much his attitude had changed over the last month. When Veronica's infidelity was revealed, any remaining grief came to an abrupt end. Her co-workers' confession to the RCMP, as well as their investigation into Tom's possible role in her abduction, had put that to rest once and for all. He was realizing that he was intellectually free to pursue other women after a reasonable period of mourning. Of course, the question was, how long was reasonable? Who was he trying to please? Connie's parents, definitely his mother, she has too. What about the boys? Not as much as they had already indicated that they saw their father and Connie as a couple. Who, then? Why not just him? Why not be concerned with what Tom Lynch felt was right? He hadn't considered what the RCMP might think. This could be an error. They raised the anchor and motored out of the cove between North Pender Island and Main Island. High tide was still a half hour away and the winds were extremely light. They remained on the motor, admiring the early morning sun and the tranquil surroundings. Before midday, scores of powerboats and sailboats, coupled with the typical ferry traffic, would clog the seascape. However, for the time being, they were among the few that arrived early. They passed through Active Pass without encountering a ferry and were now in Georgia Strait, 
traveling north toward the entrance to English Bay. What a little wind! There was blue, mostly on the island side, but they decided to set sail nonetheless, expecting the wind would kick up later that morning. It looked like it would be a long day returning to Fisherman's Cove. By lunchtime, they realized they wouldn't be able to reach their home port until dark unless they utilized the motor all the way with just the two of them and a decreasing tide. They would have a hard time docking. Can you get someone to cover for you tomorrow? Tom asked. There's only me, Tom. On the other hand, I'll be able to stay in touch because I'm carrying my crackberry. I could handle a day off to play hooky. She smiled. Yeah, I will phone the office and leave a message. I will not be in tomorrow. I have not had a day off since. For quite a long. Let's pick a location to stay that serves a decent supper. Ladysmith? Nanaimo. Connie recommended Nanaimo. There's a good tavern right on the bay by the float plane dock. Good. I won't need to dress up. You would look great in anything. He grinned without looking at her. Why, thank you, sir. That is an extremely lovely thing to say to a woman. Mr. Lynch, what do you mean by that? This is exactly what it sounds like. You know you're a beautiful woman, that any red-blooded heterosexual male would dream about you in an instant. Are you telling me you're not red-blooded, or are you not heterosexual? She smirked. You know better than that. He snapped, his voice still full of fun. So what is it about me that turns you off? She offered a humorous challenge. Connie, how did I get myself into this conversation? Tom scowled. Well, Thomas Lynch... If you haven't worked it out yet, I have a plan to seduce you. I've been patient up until now. Now I'm going to be persistent. You have no valid excuse for resisting me. Tom examined her carefully, determining how much was frivolous fun and how much was serious from all appearances. It was three quarters serious and one quarter entertaining. Not only that, but she had tossed down the gantlet, which he had to determine whether to pick up. If he did, his entire existence would alter. Do you think we're hurrying things a little? He managed softly after a long quiet. No, I do not. She spoke aggressively. Furthermore, we are not required to publicly disclose our personal lives. I live alone, and my boys are nearly grown and out of the house. I've been waiting for you for twenty years, Tom. I don't believe I can remain patient much longer. I'm not a teen with raging hormones. I'm a thirty-three-year-old lady whose clock is ticking louder and louder every year. I desire you and I want at least one child with you. Can I say it any clearly than that? The expression on Tom's face revealed the story. Connie had never expressed her desire so directly and forcefully. She didn't hold back, even expressing her desire for his child or children to build a family all over again. Could he handle it? He was extremely unimpressed by her declaration. No, I suppose not. You've pretty much put it on the line. So, what should I say? He inquired, perplexed by the previous few minutes. You were supposed to say that. You've been feeling for me for at least 15 years, and you can't wait to get me into your bed and screw my brains out. Tom detected the return of Connie's odd sense of humor. Oh, anything else? He inquired warily. Take one step at a time, Tom. She grinned. Take one step at a time. Tom returned to the windscreen and stared out at nothing as his mind raced from Connie's frontal assault. Connie prudently said nothing, leaving him to deal with her strong assault on his senses. Finally, he turned to her. How precisely does one go about screwing someone's brains out? He questioned, and Connie burst into laughing, bending double in the large cockpit, releasing all of the stress built up over the last five minutes. Through her tears, she noticed Tom laughing too. The stress was gone, and she went the short distance to him, placed her arms around his neck, and kissed him as deeply as she had ever kissed anybody in her life. She said, If you let me... I will show you. I will look forward to that. He whispered, bringing her back for another long kiss. Do you mean that? She asked. I wasn't sure he was being serious. Are you withdrawing your offer? He teased. Never. You are mine, Mr. Thomas Lynch, and I will never let you go. Tom had no doubt that she meant what she said. What are you thinking right now? She asked, looking him firmly in the eyes. I'm curious why you're so certain I'm not going to disappoint you, he said quietly. You know how Veronica can only have one or two drinks before she starts to babble? She's bragged enough about your performance to persuade me. Tom paled when she voiced her confidence, and Connie noticed his mood alter right away. What is wrong? 
Are you uncomfortable about what she might have said? Yeah, I assume that is meant to be private. I didn't expect her to smear it all over the place, Tom. She was my sister. She was more likely to tell me than anyone else. I've never heard her tell anyone else anything intimate. He stared at her with sadness. I suppose we'll never know for certain, will we? I wonder what she told her partner about me. Cut it out, Tom, she advised softly. Let it go. She's gone. I'm here for you. I'll make sure you forget the bad and remember the good. That's all I can hope for, isn't? Forget the negative and recall the positive. Yeah, and then I'll demonstrate how good can be. She smiled. I think I'm going to lose all ability to resist your charms. He stated it resulted in another deep kiss, and she could feel him relax once more. It would be a slow process to restore him to the guy he was before the accident, but Connie was committed to the task. Tom Lynch was hers alone. Just before five o'clock on Sunday afternoon, the lady motored into Nanaimo Harbor. Tom's mental surrender to her has lasted more than three hours. They had talked about trivial matters. Tom wanted to talk to her about the topics he was unsure about. What were her likes and dislikes? He felt he knew, but he wasn't sure. There was so much more to learn about. Someone who was committed to catching him for life. Connie had backed off after her final proclamation, pushed him to the end of the diving board, and forced him to make a choice. Jump or walk away. He decided to jump. However, the outcome was never guaranteed. Inside, she was ecstatic about his decision. She was confident she could win his heart. They had too much in common, and he was about to get as much physical and emotional love as he could bear. The old proverb goes, in for a penny, in for a pound. Tom was thinking about it as they walked back to the boat from the pub together. Their supper was quiet, as the restaurant was only about a third filled on a Sunday night. He made some kind of commitment to Connie, but he wasn't sure what it was. Perhaps it was simply about love. He was not kidding himself. Connie obviously considered it long term. Their talk during the lunch was cautious, avoiding the obvious. You're awfully quiet, Connie murmured gently as they stepped onto the dock. Are you having second thoughts? I'm not sure, but to be honest, I suspect I am. Maybe I'm feeling guilty, you know, as if I were cheating on Veronica. That is ridiculous, I understand, but in the back of my mind, that's what's bothering me. I'm unsure how to handle it. Connie paused and turned to face him. She had a genuine expression of sadness on her face, which he had not seen in a long time. Tom, I will not force you to do anything that makes you unhappy. I know exactly what I want, but not at any price. I'm going to back off and let you determine when or if it's appropriate. He nodded and smiled. Thanks. You are something special, and I love you. I am just not sure what that love is yet, this time. Connie gave a resigned smile. Once again, she would force herself to be patient and not hurry this man. When the time came, she wanted to make it permanent. They climbed aboard and descended to the lounge. Tom poured each of them a brandy and turned on the television. They sat beside each other in quiet, watching a PBS special about a well-known rock star. It took their minds off of recent events until they were ready to retire. He kissed her goodnight and walked slowly into the forward stateroom. Connie sat in the lounge, thinking about her situation. She was discouraged that she had come so near but still couldn't persuade Tom to commit. She knew better than to enter his stateroom that night. That might wreck everything. She needed to be prepared to wait once more. But how much longer could she endure this? She had her own life to lead. And if Tom wasn't going to be a part of it, she needed to take a different path. Tom lay in his bunk, wide awake, thinking only about that afternoon's conversation with Connie. Had he backed out? Perhaps he was split between his natural yearning for the lovely woman and his concern about what it might imply for both of them. Was he truly plagued by Veronica? He forced himself to consider her an adulteress, but the thought of confronting her gave him no satisfaction. Hearing her excuses, her unfaithfulness became just a piece of information. No more. It left a void in him from what he had always thought was a perfect marriage, or at least as perfect as he could expect. He heard the soft chimes of the ship's clock. Time to strike midnight. He'd been lying awake for two hours, with no chance of falling asleep anytime soon. He got out of bed and softly opened the door. The lights were turned off in the main cabin, but the dark light shone through the skylight, 
and he noticed the door to Connie's aft stateroom was closed. He took a beer from the fridge, plugged his headphones into the speakers, turned on a local soft rock station, and sat on one of two neighboring seats. The music soothed him. There were no annoying commercials on a Sunday night. He must have finally drifted off into a dreamy sleep. He fought to remember them, but his conscious mind told him it was pointless. He rarely remembered his dreams. But these dreams were different. All except one, that is. Connie was crying in the background with her hands covering her eyes. He couldn't understand what she was trying to say, but she was upset about something. It was extremely confusing. Then there was the fragrance. That female fragrance. Veronica. Scent. No, not exactly. And now for the touch. His lips were so soft that he could barely feel them. Regardless, they were present. His head jerked back in alarm. He was awake now. Coming out of that confusing dream, I wondered what had happened. And then he recognized Connie. She knelt before him. As he regained consciousness, he recognized her scent and lips. He looked around. He was on the boat. Connie was not sobbing. She smiled at him. He reached up to rub his eyes and remembered taking off his headphones. He blinked and tried to get himself together. I must have fallen asleep, he croaked. She nodded. She held up the beer bottle and Tom noticed that half of it was gone. She drank herself to sleep. She grinned, I suppose. What time is it? Approximately two o'clock. What are you doing outside? Couldn't you sleep either? He shakes his head. No, you two are afraid. She did say, however, that you must have had a very vivid dream. You were talking in your sleep, but I couldn't understand it. Do you do this frequently? Not as far as I know. At the least. Veronica never mentioned it. I was impressed. Veronica was an extremely fortunate woman. Why did you cry? He asked absently. Crying? I was not crying. Oh, I assumed you were. I guess that was in my dream. I am happy. I'm glad you weren't crying. She had remained on her knees, her arms resting on his thighs, her face tilted up to him, even without makeup. She was incredibly beautiful. Flawless complexion with a light sprinkling of freckles on her cheeks, lovely blue eyes, and even the reckless tumble of her golden hair seemed to be a perfect frame to her face. That must have been some dream, she said in a soft, husky voice. I don't usually remember dreams, but this one was so vivid. If I remember my college psychology course correctly, the ones you remember are the ones that feature stress or danger, he said. I wouldn't be surprised by the stress, Tom. You've been under a lot of stress in the previous three months, just when you might have been getting past Veronica's death. The cops arrived with the story of her infidelity, which could not have helped. I didn't want to hurt you, he said. It seemed like a non sequitur. What? You were crying, covering your eyes. I did not intend to hurt you, he repeated. How could you hurt me? She inquired, now quite curious. You were there, standing in the background, fully dressed, and you were crying. Oh, God. Tom Freud would have a field day with that dream, she quipped, almost instantly regretting it. Yeah, I guess, but I remember being unhappy, like I didn't want to do something, I almost... Well, never mind. He brought his hands up softly to her face. You? Almost what? He inquired gently. I almost took advantage of you. What stopped you? I do not know. Maybe you were mumbling something as if you were attempting to prevent something from happening. He thought about it for a moment. Maybe. Maybe I was attempting to get you to stop sobbing. She gave a soothing smile and took his hands in hers. You care about me, don't you? She stated. You know I do. I am simply trying to figure out whether it is more than that. He stared at her for a long time before continuing. Connie, will you stay with me tonight? She nodded and helped him get out of the chair, guiding him to his stateroom. It reaffirmed to her that this was the time she had been waiting for when he awoke the next morning. He was temporarily disoriented. He was lying on his side, holding Connie's beautiful body. He slowly raised his head, returning his gaze to the clock on the bulkhead. It was after 8 p.m., well past his usual waking time. His thoughts turned back to yesterday night's chat concerning his dream. What did all of this mean? Why did he care? It was only a dream, but didn't dreams signify something? They were the gateway to the subconscious. But one thing was true. He had made passionate love to his sister-in-law last night, and she was clearly satisfied. Connie stirred and turned to face him. 
Are you awake? Yes. I was just thinking about last night. You understand how much I wanted to make love to you. I wanted to make it perfect for you. Yes, it was. She yawned. I've never felt so good, Tom. Never. Tom commented on how cozy I felt when I awoke. You were here and I could smell your lovely fragrance. I had forgotten how important that one thing was to me every morning. I do not want to give up again. This cannot be a one-time event, Connie. I couldn't handle it. I understand that is not what you are thinking. But what about you and me? If we were going to get together? I don't do things halfway. Connie couldn't help but notice how serious he appeared while speaking. She smiled. Did you really think I'd be pleased with a one-time thing? I don't know, he replied. What was I supposed to say? My head is so messed up. I can't think clearly. She went silent again, observing him as he struggled with his ideas. She strained to think of something to say to him that would help relieve his confused mind. Tom resumed his silence, still on his back, staring at the cabin ceiling. Connie rolled closer to him, placing her arm across his chest and drawing him close to her. I'm going to make things better for you, Tom. I promise. I am going to make it better. He rolled towards her. His arm was now wrapped around her, keeping her close. I believe you, Connie. I really do. Connie stood behind Tom, her arms around his waist, as he led the lady across the gulf and into the entrance to Howe Sound. The wind was strong and had turned to the west, making the journey faster than predicted. The traffic was light, as expected on a Monday morning. Not everyone had the option of playing hooky that day. As she reflected on last night and early that morning, she remembered the beginning of their affair. It had taken her by surprise. She found Tom Lynch from last night only after they had cooled down and talked, which was so unlike what she expected from him. They'd made love. That's exactly what it was, my darling. It was perfect. Veronica had not been bragging, that was a fact. He was a fantastic lover. She had never felt so content in her life. All she wanted was to be with him, to hold him like she did now. I didn't lose contact with him for a moment. This is what she had envisioned, what she had long desired. And now it was come to pass. She had never felt so joyful in her entire life, as luck would have it. They returned to Fisherman's Cove around half-tide, which made docking the boat easier. Connie stood on the pier, holding the four-and-a-half lines and rapidly tying them off as Tom carefully pulled the large vessel into position. First the stern, then the bow. They quietly piled their belongings onto a nearby cart and moved it up the ramp to the parking lot. They rode in quiet to Tom's house. Each lost and considered the ramifications of the previous weekend. Their relationship had changed irreversibly. There was no going back. However, none of them wished to revert to their old status for personal reasons. They wished to continue on the course they had jointly selected. Connie was the most desperate to see it through. Tom, however, was also settled. He made a decision and planned to stick to it. The only question now was when they would inform others about the change. Come in, Tom said as they pulled into his driveway. I doubt the boys are home so we can relax and talk a little. Connie nodded, then turned off the ignition and applied the handbrake. Tom pulled the two canisters from the back hatch while Connie grabbed his overnight bag. He tried the front door, but it was, as usual, locked. He inserted his key and opened the door, allowing her to enter ahead of him. Is anybody home? he called. No one responded right once, but a few moments later Mrs. Calderon, the housekeeper, peeked tentatively out of the washroom into the kitchen. Oh, it's you, Mr. Lynch. I was not expecting you. Vernon stated that you were sailing and would not be home till later. Yes, Tom smiled. Miss Fairley and I caught a wonderful brisk breeze today and returned early. Is everything all right? Yes, sir. Tony is at the factory while Vernon went to the university to inquire about courses, books, or whatever. Have you had a wonderful weekend? She asked. Yes, very great. We traveled to Staten Island. Beautiful weather all the way. The middle-aged woman smiled and returned to the laundry room to sort and fold clothes from the dryer. Tom reached into the refrigerator and took out a huge bottle of Pinot Grigio, already open. He took two glasses from the cupboard above and poured one for each of them before motioning her to return to the back deck. Connie led and Tom followed, sitting in chairs around the glass-topped table in the center of the deck. She's not a busybody, 
but I don't want her listening in on our chat, he explained. Connie nodded in agreement and sipped her wine. After a few false starts, Tom started. So where do we go from here, Connie? Is it too soon to speak with our parents or the boys? She did not respond immediately, looking at her wine glass. She probably meant a length. I don't feel compelled to tell anyone yet, Tom. We haven't even begun to adjust to the concept that we'll be together. I believe we both have a lot to learn about each other. Now you're beginning to sound like me. What happened to the woman who said, Darn the torpedoes, full speed ahead? He chuckled. Do you have second thoughts? She shook her head forcefully. No, absolutely not. I've waited too long for this. Now I'm going to savor every minute of it. I really don't want to hurt anybody. I suppose my mother occupies the majority of my thoughts, and yours too. They may get annoyed if they believe we are hurrying things. How about the boys? He asked. I'm not too bothered about them. I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't have a clue. Because I'm here so often, I feel really at ease among them, and I believe they feel the same way around me. Maybe it's just a teen thing, he joked. What do you think? She replied with a raised eyebrow. Youth, whether male and female, frequently experience rage hormones. She laughed. I'd be flattered but not interested. Regardless of how nice they are, I have feelings for their father. Tom fell motionless, gazing out across the backyard. After a few minutes, he turned to face Connie. Connie reached out and squeezed his hand for reassurance. She wanted to run to him, hold him tightly, and tell him everything was fine. But she didn't. Mrs. Calderon was smiling and looking from the kitchen window, but neither of them noticed. Nothing was decided in the afternoon. Aside from not wanting to declare their mutual desire to the family right away, they hoped to see each other regularly and keep their relationship hidden for another three months before disclosing it. Tom was skeptical that they would be successful for so long, but he was willing to try. It worked for a time. August turned out to be hot and dry as usual. On weekends, Tom and Connie took advantage of every opportunity to hit on the lady. Neither of the boys seemed interested and had a variety of reasons why they couldn't go. Neither he nor Connie were disappointed. Of course, it provided them with privacy to spend intimate personal time together. When the boys returned to school, Tom's situation appeared to be unchanged. He was encouraged by the fact that they would be home nearly every night. The upheaval that followed Veronica's death had shortened the intermission from mid-April to June. During their summer vacations, Vern split his time between studying and writing his scholarship exams and his latest girlfriend, while Tony started working at Lynchpin Plastics this summer, assigned to quality assurance for the entire three months, and Tom had his own work to keep him busy. He thought about Connie every day, planning when they could be together more frequently than simply on weekends. He was getting more certain that he loved her. His mind no longer recalled memories of Veronica. It was a relief. His dreams no longer included her either. Connie had removed all of those photographs. In fact, he realized he hadn't been thinking about Veronica much lately. A call from their family lawyer, Malachi Wise, on September 1st, Wednesday morning, rekindled the memories. Hello, Tom. It's been a long time since we talked. How are you? The older gentleman inquired. I'm all right, Malachi. I'm doing okay. What do I owe the honor of your call? He joked. Actually, Tom, I wondered why you hadn't come in to discuss Veronica's will. Perhaps I should have contacted sooner, but since I hadn't heard from you, there didn't appear to be any urgency. Her will? I hadn't given it much thought. I had forgotten she owned one. To be honest, all I thought about was my will and making sure it was up to date. Furthermore, she hasn't been formally declared deceased yet, just missing, assumed drowned. Yes, that is true. However, this does not stop us from assuming she has died and opening the will for examination. We simply cannot take any action on its terms. Why don't we schedule a meeting to discuss that and a few other loose ends from her estate? Sure. I will make myself available when it is convenient for you. How about Friday? Come in shortly before noon and we may eat lunch together. He said, I'd like to catch up on how you and your family are. I'd enjoy that, Malachi. See you in your workplace around noon on Friday. Then. Tom sat back down in his office chair after hanging up the phone. He hadn't considered Veronica's financial or personal concerns since the burial. It was true that he had forgotten the will, 
but when Malachi suggested more loose ends, he pondered what they may be. When Tom arrived at Malachi Wise's office on Friday, he found the man chatting with his secretary while waiting for him. Hello, Tom, he spoke while extending his hand. It's been way too long since we've been together. The white-haired man smiled. What time do you have to return? Tom inquired, presuming Malachi was free in the afternoon. Schedule one or two appointments, no rush. I cleared my calendar on Friday afternoons. Years ago, there had to be some incentive for achievement. They spoke amicably as they strolled down the street to a well-known restaurant. Tom held the door open as they entered, and the maitre d' greeted Malachi warmly. They were seated within a minute, and a waiter took their drink orders. How are you doing, Tom? How are you doing after that terrible accident? Yes, things are much better now, thank you. I've accepted that she's gone, and I still have many years to go. If I am lucky, I will start a new life. You can count on it. That's great. I'm very pleased to hear that. I was thinking the other day how it didn't seem so long ago, that you have lost your father, and now Veronica. It must have been extremely difficult to deal with. Tom nodded but did not respond. Okay, enough of that. Tell me what you've been doing. Have you ever been out on the boat? Yes, multiple times. Mostly with Veronica's sister, Connie. She's helped me get out of my slump and stay active. That is wonderful. And how are the boys? Fine, both in school and as far as I can tell. Doing well. It's still early, so I'll probably find out closer to Christmas. They ate in a comfortable silence, as two friends would. Despite their age gap, Tom had always enjoyed meeting and working with Malachi Wise. He was nothing like the stereotypical school TV lawyer. He was calm, funny, insightful, and wise. He virtually always gave sound advice. As they finished their lunch and drank the provided coffee, Malachi focused on the reason for their meeting. Tom, did you know that Veronica included an addition to her will just a few weeks before she vanished? No, I did not. What type of addendum? He inquired, puzzled by the facts. I do not know. She gave me a sealed letter addressed to you and to be included in the will. Nothing changed in terms of the will's basic provisions. The only change was the addition of the letter, because you possess a copy of her will. I see no reason why you can't read the letter right now. And this occurred just before the accident? Yes. Malachi stated March 29th, just less than three weeks before that dreadful weekend. I cannot imagine what it would be about. I suppose I won't know until I read it. Why don't we go back to your office and address everything Tom suggested? Of course, let me fetch the bill, he volunteered. If Tom knew anything about Malachi, it was that the bill would not appear on any subsequent billings. They walked five minutes back to his office, and Malachi shut the door behind them. After asking his assistant not to interrupt them, he sat behind the wide, cheerful desk that had belonged to his father before him sitting back in a comfy, large leather chair. He examined every aspect. The gentleman lawyer. He removed a folder from his center desk drawer, placed it in front of him, and opened it. He took out the actual will, a cream-colored envelope, and some other papers. Nothing has changed in the body of her will since you both submitted them to me. So unless you wish to refresh your memory, I'll leave it. I suppose you have a copy at home or in a safe deposit box? He asked. Yes. Both of our copies are in there. The only thing to be concerned about is this envelope. I'm not sure what it contains, so if you want to open it in privacy, I'll leave the room until you're done. Thank you. Tom spoke as Malachi rose and discreetly exited the room, closing the door behind him. He took up the envelope and looked at it. The paper was hefty, quality paper with one name printed in ink on the front. Tom. He got a bad sensation about what it might hold. He was originally hesitant to open it, but eventually his curiosity got the best of him. He took Malachi's letter opener and slit the top flap. As he unfurled the pages, he discovered other similar pieces of paper. He saw Veronica's unusual, beautifully tidy handwriting. He felt his gut knot, giving him a brief pause before starting to read. My dearest Tom, as you read this, you know I'll be gone. I haven't decided on my exit yet, but I won't be able to put it off much longer. I apologize for causing you grief, but I have chosen this method to explain why the word selfish is vital. And you'll see it several times throughout this message. Earlier this year, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, 
My doctor proposed a treatment plan, but before I agreed, I urged her to be absolutely honest with me. What were the chances of my recovery? It took some time for her to admit that they were one in five. Not good odds. I am sure you will agree. At that time, I had made a selfish decision. I acknowledge that I chose not to agree to the treatment. Naturally, my doctor tried to persuade me out of it, but I refused. I informed her that no one should know about this condition, and I made her pledge that she would not tell anyone. Chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and any combination of medications would be quite unpleasant. And honestly, I'm not that fearless. I chose the easiest way out. I would let the cancer run its course until I couldn't take it any longer, and then I would die on my own terms. They call it the coward's way out. But I disagree. I couldn't bear the agony and pity in your eyes or those of our family and friends. I am, if nothing else, an excellent actress. I concealed that information from you and everyone else. I never had any indication that any of you suspected anything was wrong. As I considered what was left of my life, I realized I was not the lady I aspired to be. I was selfish. I thought about myself first, regardless of anyone else might be involved. You gave me everything. Your love, commitment, dedication, and of course the material possessions that I desired. I had everything a woman could want. An attractive, prosperous, and loving husband, two wonderful sons, a supportive family, and a lovely home. I was spoiled. But that didn't come to me until I had to confront my own mortality. Looking in the mirror, I realize who I really am, and I'm not particularly proud of it. I began having an affair with another man shortly before being informed of my fate. It does not matter who he was. And no, you do not know him. Why? Because I could. He wanted me and I want the excitement of something prohibited and entirely different from what anyone would ever expect of me again. It was selfish of me, but at the time, all I cared about was not getting caught. This would have been devastating. I am not telling you this to hurt you, only to show you who I truly was. I wish I could explain why I would cheat a man like you, someone who would gladly take advantage of a married lady. I cannot. In the back of my mind, I figured I could get away with it, and this would be my filthy little secret. I didn't mean for it to last, only to enjoy the pleasure of cheating. I wanted to quit the affair several weeks ago, but I did not. It cannot last much longer. When I was honest enough to compare him to you, I discovered that he failed in every aspect. It had lost all of its excitement and rewards. It was simply cheap and selfish. I did it for myself. I've been attempting to write this letter for the past month. I now realize that the time I have left is short. Sooner or later, you will detect changes in me. I cannot let that happen. I love you, Tom, as much as I love anyone other than myself. I'm not very proud of myself, but this is who I am. Now I can at least be honest with myself, take proper care of our sons. They will be devastated by my demise. And please do not share this letter with them or my parents. I'm informed there will be an autopsy, so the sickness will be disclosed. But if I could stop it, I would. You will survive, my hubby. There's another woman who loves you more than I do. Constance has adored you since she first met you, but nothing has changed. Let her comfort and adore you, Tom. She will never treat you in the same way that I treated her. You will discover genuine happiness and deep abiding love, something I was incapable of providing. Take care, my husband, and farewell, Veronica. He put the letter down. Tears fall down his cheeks. All the answers to all the questions were present. He could almost imagine her walking over the rail on the lady and falling into the lake, putting an end to her suffering. He had no idea how long he had sat there, staring at the letter in his palm, the sorrow of her confession seeping deeper with each passing instant. Finally, he heard a faint knock on the door. Come in, he whispered, wiping his tears and standing as Malachi returned to the room and approached. Are you okay? he inquired, solicitous. I don't know how to respond to that. Malachi. Veronica wrote a letter. This was a confession. She had terminal cancer and planned to finish everything before she couldn't take it longer. She never mentioned anything to anyone about it. None of us realized she was ill, but there was more, Tom said, sinking back into his chair. Can I presume that this is all done under attorney-client privilege? Of course. Malachi responded swiftly. You had best read this. Tom sat silently as Malachi read Veronica's letter. He could see the aging lawyer's eyes widen as he read. His expression of astonishment and horror was clear. 
After a few minutes, he shook his head and placed the letter on his desk. Tom, I never imagined that. There is more. Something I should have told you at the time. Two months after her abduction, I was invited into RCMP headquarters for an interview. That's when I first learnt of Veronica's infidelity. They asked if I'd heard of Mr. So-and-so, and I responded no. That was the truth. I didn't recognize the man and had never heard his name. Then they claimed they had gotten information that this individual was having an affair with Veronica. The tip must have arrived long after Veronica vanished. They questioned the man and forced him to admit that he was in a relationship with Veronica. They then stated that if I knew she had a partner, I would have a reason to get rid of her. Naturally, I denied any information, and they appeared to accept that I was released. I haven't heard from them since. Why didn't you call me Tom? You put yourself in a very perilous situation. I understand, but I was innocent and didn't expect to be accused of anything. It turns out I wasn't. Tom, I don't think we should take it as given. The police can sometimes take a long time to construct a case before filing charges. It would be unwise to simply wait without taking any action. What shall I do? Tom asked. I have a suggestion. Malachi spoke. I believe we should contact the RCMP and go there to present them with this letter. It proves nothing about what you knew or didn't know about her affair, but it does show that Veronica intended to commit herself. Deletion. That would undoubtedly negate any motivation on your part. All right. Tom agreed. I hadn't heard anything from them in months, so I wasn't expecting it. Unless her remains wash up elsewhere, I doubt she will ever be located. And even if it is, I have no idea what condition it would be in. Do you remember who you were speaking with at headquarters? The lawyer inquired. Tom answered, Yes, I have their cards, taking them out of his wallet. Why don't I give them a call and schedule an appointment? I'll handle the talking, and you can join as a silent party. Let's see if we can put this all to rest and get a death certificate issued when the matter is closed. It went better than Tom expected. They met with Janice and Philip Tony at their office, and Malachi showed them the letter, which said that it was received on March 29th, three weeks before she disappeared. Tom supplied a sample of her handwriting to ensure that it was written by Veronica. They departed RCMP headquarters an hour later, pleased that the investigation had been concluded and that Malachi could now petition the court for a death certificate. Veronica's will contained little to distribute other than her jewelry, clothes, and car. Tom would handle that himself, with Vern finally acquiring title to his mother's car in order to commute to SFU. Tony had bought his own car with the money from his summer work at Lynchpin. Tom would hold the jewelry until it was handed to Vern and Tony's future spouses. With the exception of a diamond pendant that Veronica bequeathed to Connie, Tom purchased the pendant for their 15th anniversary, and Connie had always adored it. In an odd way, the letter had alleviated Tom's concerns about Veronica's death. He finally understood what had happened to her and why. In some ways, he understood. But he was still disappointed that she had decided to leave them without the opportunity to say goodbye. Only the police, Malachi and Connie, would know about the affair. He didn't want Veronica's memory marred by anything as shady as her affair turned out to be. When he got home, he contacted Connie. Would you mind if I came over there? I've got something to show you. Of course not, Tom. When will you be here? I'll notify Mrs. Calderon that I'm leaving for the evening, and she may leave something for the boys to eat. Undoubtedly, it would be a heat-and-serve pizza. I should be in your house in a half hour. I'll put something on for both of us, she explained. He could sense a smile in her voice, true to his word. Tom parked his Audi in the visitor parking lot at Connie's townhouse half an hour later. He approached the front door and was about to ring the bell when it opened, and a bright, cheerful Connie greeted him. Hello, lover. Connie grinned as she wrapped her arms around his neck and kissed him firmly. Hi. He succeeded when she eventually let go of her lip lock. Once inside and sitting on the sofa with her, they shared kisses before Tom placed the cream-colored envelope on the coffee table in front of them. What is that? she asked. I visited Malachi's today. Veronica included that letter in her will, only to be opened after her death. She gave it to Malachi less than a month before her disappearance. I think you should read it. She nodded, noticing Tom's serious expression. He took it up and gave it to her. I will fetch you a drink while you read. He remarked this as he rose and went to the kitchen. 
He poured two glasses of wine from an open bottle before returning to the living room. When he arrived, he noticed tears flowing down Connie's cheeks, her jaw shaking as she read the letter. When she was finished, she dropped the letter and drew Tom to her, holding him close. I had no idea, she cried. I did not observe any signs. Nothing. I understand. Neither did I. She tricked us all. I suppose it explains what happened that night to the lady. Connie nodded, tears still falling from her eyes. My poor sister, knowing she was dying but hiding it. She was correct. She was an amazing actor. I can't quite believe it. She paused. I suppose it's a caution to me to be cautious. Cancer can run in families. I hadn't considered it, Tom said. Tom, we can't tell my folks about this. Self-delete or affair. They must never have realized it would kill them. Tom nodded. Agreement. I won't inform either the boys or my mother. They do not need to know. I'd rather people have pleasant recollections of her than what's in that letter. After you've viewed it, I'll put it in the safe deposit box. I'm the only one who has access to it, but I'll probably add you to it shortly. Are you okay with that? Do you want me to destroy it? I do not know, she cried. I honestly don't. It's too soon to make a decision. Why don't you put it away and let us decide if we want to destroy it? Okay. I'll put it in the box tomorrow so no one finds it by accident. It was a quiet supper, and then they sat on the sofa, attempting to watch television. However, I am finding it tough to concentrate. Finally giving up, Connie rose and took Tom's hand, guiding him to his bedroom. They would make love in silence, but with the compassion that Connie had grown accustomed to from her guy, he seems to know exactly when to soothe her in this manner, saving the more forceful and intense lovemaking for another time. He had no intention of returning home that night. She needed his warmth and soothing presence to stay calm. The letter had a significant impact on her thoughts for her late sibling. She almost realized why she did what she did. Almost, but not quite. The affair began before she was aware of her sickness. Veronica's awareness of her sister's feelings for Tom, as well as her desire to see her happy, were almost as shocking. It appears she didn't know her sister at all. Connie. I think it's time to tell the lads and our parents about ourselves. I adore you and hope to marry you someday, and I want everyone to know that, he explained. She grinned at him. Yes, I want that too. Tom, tomorrow will be a new day. It's a fresh day for us. Thank you for listening to today's stories. If you enjoyed listening, please like and subscribe, if you haven't already. Also, write a comment below with your thoughts on what transpired. Take care.